Hello and welcome to another edition of Global Sources Virtual Summit brought to you by Gemba. I'm your host, Megla Bhardwaj, and my co-host Karen Chen will be joining us shortly. Over the next two days, we're going to be bringing you amazing content presented by 17 global e-commerce and sourcing experts from around the world. So let me share with you what we are going to be uh, doing over the next couple of days. So first of all, this is Global Sources Virtual Summit presented to you by Gemba. Now, um, Global Sources Virtual Summit, in case you don't know, this is actually an in-person summit that used to be held in Hong Kong. And it, it has been held in Hong Kong since April 2016. It's in fact one of the very first conferences globally uh, to be held for Amazon sellers. And this is the 13th edition of Global Sources Summit. And it's being held virtually for the fifth time. So how can you register for the summit and what are the benefits of registering for the summit? So first of all, the summit is being live, live streamed on all of Global Sources social media channels, whether it's Facebook, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn. So all you need to do is search for Global Sources on any of the social media channels and you'll find the live stream there. But you can also register. So go to globalsources.com forward slash summit to register for the summit. And when you do register, you're going to receive notifications. You'll receive all of the replays. And you can also join our exclusive Telegram group. What to expect over the next couple of days? First of all, hundreds of actionable tips to up your sourcing game, to up your product development and a branding um, game. 17 expert presenters from around the world focusing on branding and product development. We've got 20, 12 plus hours of live sessions. All of the sessions are live, but in case you're not able to join any of the sessions, don't worry at all because you are going to be getting the replays of all the sessions. We've got suppliers that we're going to be featuring uh, in the summit as well. We've got 16 suppliers that will showcase their products. And we've got lots of prizes to win. So stay until the end of all of the sessions because we are going to be giving away lots of cool prizes. We've got two days of amazing content. The summit is held over four sessions. Uh, so today is the first session. It starts at 7 a.m. Hong Kong time. Then we've got an, a session in the evening that starts at 4 p.m. Hong Kong time. And the session is uh, the entire conference is live. So you can engage with the speakers. You can ask any questions that you might have. And best of all, it's absolutely free. You don't have to pay anything at all for this summit. OK, um, once again, how to join the sessions. So what you can do is the easiest way to bookmark the sessions is to go to Global Sources YouTube channel. So once you're in YouTube, go to um, upcoming live stream under videos. That's the second step. Then the third step is click on set reminder on four um, sessions that you see over there. You'll see four posts where there are scheduled um, sessions for each of the four sessions. And you just click set reminder on those posts. So first of all, I want to thank our sponsor, our headline sponsor, Gemba, for uh, sponsoring the Global Sources Summit. And let's quickly take a look at this video uh, from our sponsor. So Gemba is an amazing company. If you're looking to develop a new product and if you want help with sourcing and product development, branding, Gemba is an amazing company to help with that. Um, and Gemba is actually giving away a free ebook. So if you go to this link, bit.ly forward slash Gemba dash ebook, it's an all lowercase, download this free ebook that Gemba is giving out about how you can differentiate and stand out with your product. We also want to thank our event partner, Tech Packs, uh, for partnering with us with the summit. And let's take a look at a quick video.
So there you have it. Thank you so much, Tech Packs, for sponsoring Global Sources Summit. Now, if you are looking to source apparel or any textile-based products, and Tech Packs are absolutely essential. And TechPacks.co is an excellent company to work with to develop Tech Packs. Um, so Tech Packs has a special offer for Global Sources Summit attendees. If you use the code Global Sources 2022 on their website, TechPacks.co, there's a 10% discount on all of their products and services. All right, so we're almost ready to get started. Now, remember, this is a live summit, so you have to make sure that you are participating live, uh, you're asking questions, you're engaging, you're posting comments, share it with your friends, and um, interact, ask, engage questions. Stay until the end to win prizes. We've got lots of cool prizes to uh, give away. And the most important thing is have fun, learn a lot at this summit. All right, so let's get started. Now, for the very first session, I'm going to invite Sabrina from Global Sources. And Sabrina hey. is going to be telling us a little bit about Global Sources Services. Hi, Sabrina. How are you doing? Hey, hello. Hello. I'm doing good. Hi. How are you? I'm doing great, Thank Sabrina. All right. So why don't you get started, Sabrina? OK, all right. Uh, let me put on my presentation. Yeah. Okay. So your presentation is on the screen and yeah, let's get started. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Sabrina. Welcome to the walkthrough and demo session for Global Sources Online. So today I'm going to introduce to you Global Sources and why you should consider using it when sourcing products. I will do a walkthrough of new sites to you to give you a holistic view of the features and capabilities and how can you use this to source from verified suppliers anytime and anywhere. And also the entire session will take only around 10 minutes. If you have any questions during the walkthrough, don't worry, we will have a short Q&A afterwards. All right, so let's begin. Um, okay, so here are some key facts you need to know about Global Sources before using our site. We are actually the first B2B sourcing platform and has been connecting authentic buyers and verified suppliers for the past 50 years. So we also featured over 8 million products from verified suppliers and more than 10 million registered buyers using our platform daily. Uh, so why choose Global Sources? So why? Well, in addition to our online marketplace, we also have trade shows in Hong Kong, Indonesia, Shanghai, and other locations. This is where you can physically meet suppliers, exchange business cards, and check out their products. We also source, we also organize online shows such as uh, offer free business matching services and hold online events such as sourcing talks and virtual summit, which you are currently attending. Uh, we also host webinar to keep you updated on the latest happenings and trends, trends in the markets. Uh, plus, it might be of interest to you that we have dedicated marketplace for India, Vietnam, and South Korea. But I'm here to talk about sourcing online. So Global Sources facilitates this praxis uh, not only by allowing you to send suppliers an RFQ or RFI, which you are already familiar with. Uh, we also provide these new features, such as a competitive price from bulk orders to ready-to-order products to fulfill different uh, sourcing needs of buyers. Our new sourcing club program, I will introduce later, let you earn points while sourcing and redeem them from rewards. You can exchange dig digital business cards online with just one single click. So, and in also, you can also immerse yourself with a 360 degree virtual tour of the suppliers. I was, I'm going to show you later. So, are you excited? Um, now, let's go. Let's have, let me help you to walk through and uh, guide you on how to using our new platform. Uh, let me share my screen now. So. Yeah, let me just remove this and yeah. So guys, if you have any questions at any time, you can type your questions in the comment section, wherever you're watching from, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, type your questions in the comments and uh, we will be addressing them as we go. Okay. Okay. We can see your screen, Sabrina. Go ahead. So entire, okay. All right. So 
uh, here is a new global sources website that launched in January this year. To access it, this, simply type globalsources.com in your browser or just search for global sources. You know, actually, our site is also mobile optimized, so you can use it any device you want to source from our website. So before we go to any deeper, let, I would like to highlight some uh, features on the homepage. Um, so if you want to just browse or source for specific items, you can check out these sections like this to uh, find products and suppliers. Here are uh, categories. We have a main categories listed here and also a subcat. And by sections, like check out, like you can check out most popular products, ACs, low, uh, MOQ, new products, and ready to orders. And also you can find the trade shows on the here on the top uh, of the website and uh, also find other services. You can see which I mentioned before, some new markets, India, South Korea, and Vietnam. Vietnam. So uh, it's all you have, you can, you can just uh, search our website and uh, find anything you want from here. So, okay, if you already know what you want to source, try here, try the search and new features. Let's see, I want a cutting board. Uh, cutting board. So here we are. So you can uh, uh, and press here. And now I would like to narrow it down a little bit. You can see all the cutting boards listed here. And uh, I can click verified manufacturer. So people may wonder why verified. This is because all this verified by global sources and also by the government and third parties. So you can trust all these suppliers. And also you can use the uh, we have this new feature by the by the type. You can search like chief knives. Let's see. Okay, all the results you can get from here. And uh, actually, all these uh, uh, result products. If you want to compare the differences, you can simply click here, make the comparison, and let's see compare. All right, so you can see highlights the difference. And uh, well, it, let's see if you are interested in all of them. You can simply click uh, inquiry now. Sorry. Um, I will select, uh, click, select all, let's see. And uh, inquiry now. Okay, you can send the inquiry to all of them. Um, after you successfully send RFI of Q, or maybe let's say place order, you know how to place the order. Let me pick a random products from here. And you can simply just inquiry from here. Or maybe like, let's say you can chat with them for the registered buyers. Um, let's, find a, let's find a better solution. Okay, uh, okay, sorry. So send the inquiry here or maybe have a chat and all your activities, you can get some rewards and how you get the rewards and you can simply redeem the coupons from here. Oh, all right, so we have talked about a lot about how, a lot about how to search for products and let's, let me uh, give you some example about uh, our, uh, let me show you some VR tools for our manufacturers. So some buyers may want to know suppliers better than better by visiting their factories or checking and checking, for example, their product production line to make a better assessment of the suppliers' capabilities. So to help both buyers and suppliers as, as much as possible. So Global Sources recently launched a VR tour on our suppliers' profile, which you can see here. Let me show you how click a uh, start a tour from here. Uh, you see, voila. You, now you can visit the supplier. It's so much easier and so much convenient. So I'm not going to show you the detail, sorry. You can check out by yourself. So we also actually offer the, uh, um, let me show you the presentation. 
Okay, we offer free videos and uh, voice call with suppliers via our app, and we also scheduling uh, an O2O trade shows that you are more than welcome to join us. So it will be live streamed across multiple platforms. So stay tuned for more details. I hope you enjoy this session, and now you can download our app. Thank you, Magla. Thank so you so much, Sabrina. I have to say this uh, virtual factory tour is one of my favorite new features of Global Sources. It's really cool that you can be sitting anywhere around the world and you, you can see inside a factory and in such a great detail. It's absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for that presentation, thank Sabrina. You. Thank you. All right, Have a good you day. take care. You Bye. too. Bye. Okay, so let's begin with our first session of Global Sources Summit. And this is a panel discussion where we're going to be talking about why branding is super important for e-commerce Amazon sellers. Now, throughout the summit, our main theme this time is product development and branding. So you are going to be hearing a lot about how to develop your own product and how to brand it. Okay, so let me invite my panelists on stage. I've got Chris Thomas from the Australian Seller. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Fantastic, Megala. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we've got Andrew Morgans. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. And we have got Vance Lee. Hi, Vance. Hey, Megala. How's everyone doing? Doing great. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today for uh, Global Sources Virtual Summit. So we're going to be talking about why branding is super important for Amazon e-commerce sellers. And so let's begin with introductions first. Chris, do you want to give an introduction and tell people about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I built a brand that was selling sleep masks on Amazon and e-commerce uh, since 2001, and I sold it a couple of years ago now. Uh, these days, I help uh, folks sell products and brand products on Amazon, as well as I still sell a little bit of other things on Amazon as well. And uh, yeah, and I do a bit of podcasting and coaching as well. So yeah, a lot of fun. That's me. There you go. Awesome. Andrew. Well, I didn't start in 2001, Chris, so you've got me beat there by a bit. <laughs> uh, but I've been in the All Amazon right. space about 11 years. Um, would like to think I was early in the industry in regards to working with others, like other sellers or other brands and manufacturers to, to launch uh, on Amazon. Probably worked with 300 different brands, um, have four or five of my own brands even currently now. And ultimately, our am set up right now to be helping brands position themselves to exit. And a lot of that has to do with getting their products or their brand um, really cohesive so that they look attractive. Okay, cool. Vance. Very cool. Um, I started e-commerce back in 2011, uh, Amazon FBA in 2015. Uh, I have a few brands in a few different niches. Um, my most notable brand is in the coffee niche where I've, um, I've created uh, a really cool coffee enhancing coffee glass that um, that won lots of rewards in that industry. Um, I found um, I, my path is a little bit different. I found Kickstarter, uh, which is crowdfunding, a, a different way of uh, launching products through um, essentially a pre-order launch model, where you don't need inventory in advance to to launch your your products. And uh, I started specializing in helping people launch through Kickstarter and grow their brands through um, through building their communities that way. So since then, I've raised about. Um, $7 million in launches um, and uh, had a few of my own products break records uh, that are in the top 1% of Kickstarter or crowdfunding projects of all time. So wow. um, that's me. That is very impressive. <laughs> and um, yeah, I can, I can attest to the coffee cups. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, let's get started. And we're going to be talking about branding. And uh, branding is, of course, very broad. But I want to ask all three of you, what is your definition of branding as it pertains to e-commerce brands specifically? So Chris, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think it's, for me, it's pretty straightforward. I think it's the experience that you offer customers through the brand and the brand, the promise that you make as a, when you're you know pushing or promoting your brand. And I think it's, also the recognition that the brand has. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're promoting the brand, you obviously want the brand to be recognized. You want it to be trusted. And, uh, and so that's sort of my, my simple two kind of buckets, I suppose, that I try and build brands around those two philosophies. 
pretty straightforward. Right. Andrew? Yeah, so I'll try to add just a little bit of something to that. Um, I think that the, the most important is that it builds trust with customers over time. And, and it's important that it's from um, the moment they see it online in an image to the moment it arrives in a box or a package at their door and that whole experience. So whether you touch them on social media or Amazon or their website uh, or on a phone call or the first time when they open that box, um, you're having consistency uh, across your product and and consistency builds trust. So um, it's really trying to stay as consistent you, as you can across each of those mediums. Right, Vance? Nice, I like that. Um, mm -hmm. I For a lot of people that haven't looked into branding when they start looking at Google and they search brand and branding, they're gonna find all these like lofty definitions. So I don't wanna go in that direction. I think Chris and uh, Chris has gone in the right direction definitely uh, and Andrew as well. Um, so I think um, being able to uh, to look at this from something that's more practical for us uh, as Amazon and e-commerce sellers, and the way that I like to define brand is to see it see it as a way or a medium that allows us to communicate what our company and our product is about. Because sometimes we're branding our company, but sometimes we're also branding our specific products in a way that's going to be a little bit different between the, the product itself. And that's what I've done in a lot of my situations in launching products as well. So um, essentially just finding a way to communicate your product or your brand um, to your audience in a way that connects and resonates with them so that they get really excited to, um, to, to, to purchase from you and to, uh, to engage with your brand in whatever way that that's gonna be later on. Right. That makes sense. So, um, Chris, you've been around for such a long time. And I think, you know, at that time, especially on Amazon, if you put up any product, it would probably just sell it. You know, there wasn't too much competition and not a lot of sellers were selling directly on Amazon. So um, why do you think branding is important for e-commerce sellers, and especially Amazon sellers today? Well, most e-commerce sellers advertise online and they promote their brands online. I mean, there's a handful, of course, that use, you know, outdoor and above the line, as it's known, you know, radio, TV, print, um, billboards, etc. cetera. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's just super important to, um, you know, really convey the brand in particularly from an advertising perspective and a social media perspective, which is what, uh, what Andrew was talking about. So, and, and on Amazon, it's, it's a little harder to, uh, to, kind of brand i suppose in terms of the control you don't you, you're sort of limited by amazon's um uh, infrastructure i suppose to be able to promote your brand there but amazon as we'll probably get into a little bit more during our, our chat today is doing is doing a lot of heavy lifting in terms of trying to promote brands and offering a lot more tools to brands in order for brands to be able to have a little bit of a slice of the amazon ecosphere in order to be able to push and promote the actual brand experience and the brand messages that uh, that we'd like to do. But yeah, you're right. Back in the beginning on Amazon, when I first started, I think it was around 2014, there was none of that. It was, <laughs> all it was was just a list of your products. You didn't have a brand yeah. page. You couldn't even advertise on Amazon. It was just, you know, everything was, was really just, you were just really constrained by what Amazon, um, you know, sort of gave you really, <laughs> and it wasn't much. <laughs> So, so uh, yeah. does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm kind of rambling a bit this morning. Yeah, so yeah, time. absolutely. I think, um, yeah, that does. I mean, uh, Vance, what do you think? Anything to add to that? Oh, Vance. Oh, you're muted, Vance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, specifically why branding is important, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think branding is really important because at the end of the day, your brand is what encourages your audience or your target audience to buy your product, to refer their friends, to buy again if you launch other products, and to engage your, with your brand in whatever way that you choose to want to engage with them. So at the end of the day, this is really what drives a lot of action. And uh, and at the end of the day, that's what you want from people that are a part of your audience. So um, it's it's about encouraging people that you want to take action to take the action that you want. And uh, th I think that's what strong brands do. Right. Now, Andrew, you, you mentioned that you also help brands uh, prepare for an exit. And so how important is branding for an aggregator that's looking to purchase a brand? I think they're looking for, um, you know, a way to package what they have and coming up with a brand story or really developing a brand story across your, let's say your slew of products can be very difficult. So if they're looking, if it's you, you're selling your business and there's someone next to you selling their business and all things being equal, one does a great job of, of telling the story of their products and their why and why they made it and who they are, they're going to stand a better chance 
um, at getting that price point that they want versus you. I mean, if all things are being equal, um, those are some of the things you think about, but it's also how do we increase order value? Um, you know, by having multiple products in a line of products, which creates a brand, essentially, um, aggregators are like, okay, there's more growth opportunities here. We can start bundling products together. We can do things like that when we have similarities. I think one thing I wanted to touch on, on why I think it's important is that, you know, if, if you get into the um, the human mind and some of the psyche there, don't quote, I'm not a scientist or anything like that, but for, for argument's sake here, um, the first thing that happens when you when you see something, which is what we're talking about doing, is selling stuff, making a lot of money. First thing that happens is an emotional reaction to that image um, or that box when you open it and it's beautiful. And you're like, oh my God, this packaging is amazing. So the first thing that happens is an emotion. It actually moves faster than our logical brain. So you want the customer to have an emotion. Think of it as like a supplement bottle just sitting there on the, on the page or a supplement bottle with a puppy or some kind of emotion like that or a picture like that creates an emotion. You think about your dog, you think about you want the life of your dog to be great. You think about your dog being calm. You want him to be calm during 4th of July. Then your brain goes to logic and says, okay, why do I want to purchase this? Like Vance was saying, get the customer to make a, make a movement that you want them to do. So I think it's, you're thinking emotion with the branding and then you're thinking back that up with logic to get them to make the purchase. And so I think branding is ultimately that storytelling and that emotional piece. Yeah, storytelling. And we'll, we will talk about story, brand story in a little bit. But um, now, Andrew, a lot of new Amazon and e-commerce sellers, um, they, you know, uh, when they start out, they have so much to do. They have to find a product. They have to source it. They have to do the listing. So in terms of branding, what are some of the key things that new e-commerce sellers should do so that they're able to, you know, start off um, um, and, and have a strong brand down the line? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I think if you look at the origins of like really the Amazon industry as it's evolved, it went from like a platform with no branding to like Chris was saying, one that allows brand registry and one that allows video and one that allows posts. And they're just every single year and every month they're, they're releasing more features. So you have to lean into what Amazon is focused on to be successful on Amazon. Um, but some tips for new 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 beginners. And um, I started at the very bottom of this. So at the very beginning, I was just, you know, figuring out products and all those kinds of things myself. Um, so I really have done every step of the way. And I would say that branding wasn't something that I paid attention to in the beginning. I wish I had. I would have more ad dollars back. I'd have higher conversion rates. I'd have, you know, probably bigger brands than I have now. I just wasn't focused on um, the industry, wasn't focused on images and creative really on Amazon when it first started. And um, so if you're thinking about a product, I think the best way to think about this is, um, you know, there's some coaches out there that say, you know, don't focus on the product, just think about the focus on the profit or they're like, um, you know, don't be too attached to the product, just find one that's, that's selling well and go grab that and launch with that product. And there is some truth to that. But what I would say also is if you can take a step back and think about what you're passionate about, your why, why are you, why are you creating this product? Is it to solve a problem? Is it your mother's recipe, your grandmother's recipe that, you know, you're bringing a product to life from, from a cooking thing. Um, think about your why, and it's much easier to create a brand story or a brand, um, down the line when it's something authentic to you. It's something that you're passionate about. It's something you care about. It's something that you think you can have maybe not just one product, but two or three or four that could go together and you could really create something around that. So I think the best thing to do when you're starting out is even if you don't have the budget for great photography or a video or something like that, is really just think about what you're passionate about around that product. And if you think there's more um, additional products that could be created around it, I think those are some initial things to think about early. Okay, cool. Vance, do you have any tips for new e-commerce sellers? Yeah, I think something that's really important um, to, to add on to what Andrew is saying is, um, you know, even if it's something that you're not super passionate about, if you're going to jump into like a niche that's new to you or new product category that's new to you, um, the important thing about branding, I think, is to really understand who your audience is. So if you're not a dog lover, if you're not a tennis player, whatever it might be, um, don't try to make it up and don't try to don't try to communicate with these people. These are your customers. Don't try to pretend like you're going to be one of those people without actually understanding what they're about. So you could watch YouTube videos, you could watch interviews, you could talk to your friends that do like dogs or are tennis lovers. Ideally, you would play tennis and you like dogs. 
but that's not always the possible. That's not always the case um, for, for a lot of sellers starting out. So um, really try to understand your customers because at the end of the day, the way that you communicate your product and your brand is what's going to resonate with them. And if you can't get a handle on this, a lot of the stuff is not going to stick. So even having like decent images and writing, like hiring a copywriter, um, it's not necessarily going to communicate that right way if you're not able to understand what's, um, you know, what's the essence of what you want to communicate with your brand or with that product. So I think really understanding your audience is going to be super key. And, uh, and, and that's going to be the foundation for everything else that builds on top of it. And when you start thinking about um, some of the more common stuff we talk about, like photos, video, logo, those types of things, mm-hmm. um, it, it all starts with having a strong understanding of who your audience is and how you want to communicate with that audience. Great insight, Chris. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, just concur with my fellow panelists, Andrew and Vance, and then add some practical tips. Um, so I think once you've actually come up with the brand identity, the name, I suppose, um, I think that in terms of a real practical, a uh, couple of practical steps here is to secure the domain name. All right, that's really important. And at the same time, get a trademark and try and match the trademark and the domain name together and that's not always an easy thing to do but if you secure those you're actually securing your sort of your brand ip you're stopping other people and other companies from marching into your territory or grabbing a domain name or even grabbing a trademark which can cause a lot of headache and heartache if you've gone down the the you know the packaging the photography the the logo design all those sort of things that you've spent a lot of money on you've you've overlooked the you know the, the domain name and the trademark i think that's a huge mistake that i've seen sellers make Right. And um, what are some of the common mistakes, uh, Chris, that you see sellers making in terms of branding, whether new sellers, experienced sellers? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, obviously, the <laughs> trademark and domain name thing, I think, is a, is yes, a huge one, is a huge one there, which I kind of mentioned. Um, uh, look, I think it's, it's just the cohesiveness of not um, handling all aspects of the brand and the way the brand is representing itself. So something that really building on what Andrew's been talking about is, and Vance um, is just around, you know, it's everything from customer experience through to the packaging, through to the, uh, the photography, the copywriting, really not leaving any stone unturned or really understanding that the entire brand experience is makes up all of what you do from the written word to the visual image uh, and, and indeed video as well. So I think it's, you know, it's not enough just to come up with a logo and slap it on your product and and push the product out into the world and hope that that's going to do enough to promote your brand uh, and to create that brand experience that uh, that Andrew and Vance have been talking about. So I think it's it's really coming up with that cohesive uh, strategy around you know content, visuals, obviously the logo and uh, and the packaging, et cetera, et cetera, and customer experience. So that's that's sort of the biggest mistakes I see. There's sort of gaps. I see a lot of gaps in for a lot of sellers and, and brand owners. Andrew, what about you? Any common mistakes, pitfalls that sellers should avoid? Well, uh, I've made most of those mistakes myself. Uh, <laughs> so not just the sellers I work with. And, you know, one thing about my agency, we're a full service Amazon agency. That's that's the space I've been in for 11 years. Um, we work with manufacturers, like all the way up to the manufacturers going direct, all the way to private label sellers or you know makers developing their own products so it really does run the gambit and i think some of those failures differ depending on the size of the organization um i think in the early years the space was pioneered by like uh, analysts data analysts and kind of like outside the box thinkers that were evaluating uh you know excel sheets down to like this product gets this much demand and here's my margins and here's what i can sell and here's my cpc it was all numbers 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 and it's really been the emotion and creatives that are last at the table, uh, so to speak. So I think in in some regard, if you're a one-stop shop, if you're a solopreneur, you're a small team, um, one thing is understanding what you're good at. And if you're great at sourcing, if you're great at product development, if you're great at ops, um, focus there and hire the help in the creative uh, and the branding space and really get someone that can help bring that story to life for you. And I think too many people try to do it all and, and you can do it. You can do it. It's just way harder. Uh, you know, if you're really great at one thing, it's, it's hard to be really great at the other. I feel like I'm um, kind of left brain, right brain. And the other thing I would say is, um, don't hire your friends, sisters, girlfriends, cousins, best friend, 
to take your photos and your graphics. You know, I think too many, too many people are trying to save uh, a dollar on creative and branding uh, when honestly doing a great job with photography uh, can help your conversion rates. It can help your click through rate. It can help your advertising spend and ROI. It can help absolutely everything. So you have to think of it more as a, as an investment that will then impact you for maybe the next year, two years, three years before you refresh them um, versus just this hard cost that you don't know what it's going to do. Um, all I can say is with my years of experience, um, really, really spending time to get that messaging and those graphics and the photos right and getting an emotional feeling from even food or whatever the case might be, whatever you're selling, creating that emotional really, really pays off in the long run when it comes back to the data. Um, so those would be some things I, I would focus on. Andrew, I've got a question for you. Sorry, Megla, I'm jumping in here and yeah. <laughs> running the show. Um, just around <laughs> the... <Take over. laughs> I'm hopeless. Uh, just, I actually wanted to ask this question. In terms of the exiting and things like that, one of the things that you've been uh, kind of alluding to is it's probably better to have a cohesive bunch of products um, that, that all sort of makes sense. Let's say you're in lawn care and you've got, I don't know, all the, all the different you know, gardening tools and things like that. Is it better to do that or can have you seen successful exits with people who have just got a disparate set of products, products that none of them match? And how do, they, how does their, how do their exits look like and how do they brand that? Well, we're definitely speaking in generalities to everyone that's listening because I, I do believe that there's exceptions to almost every rule. And, you know, I've had brands that I've been with for seven years that have a three SKU count that are doing 18 million a year on Amazon. Right. Uh, it's not about necessarily the breadth of the catalog. Um, other times, you know, I would say that as an, an aggregator looking at a brand, they are looking for a certain revenue amount for you to be attractive to them. And having when they look to buy something, they're like, you know, buy this one product, this one product, this one product, this one product, this one product as a whole is not as interesting to them as saying, hey, let me buy these six that together amount in this much amount of revenue. Um, I have yet to really see any any big accounts go that are just a, a wide variety of products, not to say it can't happen. Um, but it seems like it's more in these in these groups of, of ASINs that are performing at a certain level. Categories, yeah. Sorry, Megal. Yeah. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. So Vance, um, what about you? I mean, what are some common mistakes that you see companies making? Um, I can add a few things here. I think one common mistake is what I could call um, doing everything in a dark room. And it's just people that are uh, excited and they, they have their own idea of how they want this to go. And they just literally just lock themselves in a room and then they come up with everything on their own uh, without getting external feedback. Well, I mean, ideal situations, you get feedback from real customers or real people as part of your audience. But the second best is getting feedback at all. And so a lot of people just go through and just, um, and just they come up with everything themselves and then they just, they just release it. And uh, once they feel like it's perfect. So I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make when it comes to mm -hmm. developing uh, th this type of like brand positioning or brand, like we don't have to go into a lot of details about what it is, but it's just in general, just working um, and, and by themselves and just trying to figure it out on their own without getting real life feedback. So that's a big, that's a big challenge. And something that Andrew touched on earlier, which was, a uh, really common thing is that I think a lot of people don't see the value um, in, in investing in um, creating a strong brand. So uh, this is seen for people that are technical and very numbers based. This is a very fluffy type of uh, airy topic. So when you talk about brands, often there's like eye rolls and it's like, ah, oh, that's not important. And it's exactly what Andrew said earlier. So I think not investing in this type of um, in this type of focus for like the creative elements of your uh, your brand. Um, photo, video, whatever it might be to make the brand uh, look and sound good. Um, that's, I think, a, a massive mistake because if you don't see it as an investment, you're going to look for your uh, girlfriend's cousin's brother and um, they're, they, might be, <laughs> they might be okay, but they're probably not going to do the best job as somebody who is actually really, really good at this type of thing. So um, I think investing and seeing, seeing branding as an expense rather than an investment is a, is, is a bit of a challenge mm -hmm. when it comes to long-term success. And, and I'll come back to this one again because I think this is a theme that I see a lot. And it's really not understanding who your audience is and what, how your company brand or product is with relationship to that audience. So not only understanding who they are, but what your brand is meant to do to address um, you know, what their problems are, what their challenges are, what they're looking for, their desires, and really understand this is the key relationship in branding is who you are and who the customer is. And really understanding that at a deep level allows you to be successful when it comes to marketing and branding your product. Right. 
So what are some ways to identify your customer and understand what exactly they need and you know how to how to target them? Uh, do you have any tips for people uh, on that? Like how can they actually identify their customer and, and understand what they what their needs are? Uh, I mean, I think in general, most people are in a niche that makes it not super difficult to do this. So if you're into dogs or into tennis players or whatever, like if you're into um, people that are cooking at home and kitchen accessories or whatever, it's it's pretty clear who your audience is. So at that point, it's about doing research and understanding the niche or the category. So you might start looking up dog blogs or you might start looking at YouTube channels that uh, focus on like reviewing cooking gear. And the idea really is to immerse yourself in it. Um, when I launched my coffee brand, I immersed myself into um, all sorts of things, coffee. Uh, I went to coffee tastings. I went, I mean, you don't have to go this crazy, but you can go as crazy as really just like meeting friends that are just super crazy about cooking or coffee and learn from those people, talk to those people, understand how they think. And a lot of the stuff you can do online. So you don't have to, if you don't like people, you don't have to go out, you don't have to leave your home. Uh, but uh, it's just really the idea is to immerse yourself into this niche. Um, find things like blogs or publications, YouTube channels, uh, influencers that are on uh, YouTube or Twitter or uh, TikTok, wherever your, your niche is, um, mm. is, is kind of hanging out. Uh, look for those people and, um, and, and, and immerse yourself in it so that you can understand. And you don't need to do this forever. This doesn't need to be like a six month long project, but most people have never done this exercise at all. So it means that they haven't really made the effort to understand who is in their niche, who the customers are and how their customers think. And uh, if you never do this, you'll, you'll essentially just never know. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to go through this process, um, even if it's just for a couple of days or whatever it might be for you to feel comfortable, because at the end of the day, um, even if you assign or like, let's say you outsource to a freelancer to do something like a design for you or some photos, you might be able to give them feedback and say, hey, like I want it done this way because I know I like this this part of, you know, how dog lovers see their, um, you know, their, their puppies or something like this. And um, that will allow the creatives to be better in a way that maybe that person didn't know that, that, that insight. So you can actually be very much involved in contributing to that process and, um, and just make it better, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just going to say in the early days when I was developing my sleep mask brand, the Hibermate, um, I'd worked night shift for a couple of years. And the reason why I invented that product was to block sound as well as light because I had to sleep during the day. And I actually initially thought that the market for my product would be night shift workers. Um, it was, it was, it's a huge untapped audience. It's a huge untapped market that are very cheap to actually advertise to because you're, you know, they're, they're up in the middle of the night. So mm. you know, at the time we didn't have yeah. the internet really. Uh, and so I, like I was ringing radio stations here in my hometown of Melbourne in Australia and saying, how much would it cost to run 10 ads? through the middle of the night to to talk to people who, you know, obviously need my product because if they're awake at 4 a.m., they're, they're going to be trying to sleep during the day. Um, it was like $60 at the time to run 10 30-second ads. It was so cheap. Anyway, moving on, I actually did, uh, to Vance's point, we didn't really have any social media. There was no TikTok. I don't even think YouTube was even born. Uh, there was just really Google. So I actually had to go out, get up in the middle of the night and go to police stations and fire stations and, and talk to ambulance people and bakers and, yeah, and do all that sort of to get that sort of feedback. I mean, I had a pretty good idea, but I think it's really important to Vance's point that you really understand your audience, what their needs are, what their problems are, and then try and create a product and an experience that solves, you know, their issues and their problems. Yeah, that makes sense. So everybody watching, if you have any questions for our panelists, type them in the comment section below. We're talking about why branding is important for e-commerce sellers uh, today. So yeah, feel free to type your questions. We will be addressing them. So let's talk about brand story. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because um, there, it's just so um, interesting. It can really help boost your sales and your overall uh, brand as well. So what do you guys think about brand story? How is it important and why is it important to create a brand story? And what are some ways to create an interesting, attractive brand story? Uh, Andrew, do you want to go first? Mm, this is a good one. Uh, yeah. 
you know, uh, this is something that I I knew a lot about, I think, storytelling, but just didn't tap into it until I was like maybe in my 30s, like a, a bit older, um, a, late, a later part of my career, so to speak. And I've really just like absolutely loved it. And I feel like I grew up from uh, I was a missionary kid for 16 years in Africa. And uh, storytelling was just a part of the culture, whether it was that was my missionary family culture or the African culture or even the religious culture. It was just always storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. And um, so I think it came a little bit natural to me, but I didn't know how to apply it to e-commerce. You know, I was always the one that needed to get all my friends to pay a little bit more attention to get my story out. I needed two more minutes, you know, and uh, what something that used to be like a, a struggle for me became a plus. Um, the storytelling piece. And I think that I've had challenges where first I started with Amazon, where it was, I'm figuring out on Amazon how to tell stories at opportunities of working with brands like Adidas early on and Suiza and some brands like that, that gave me amazing content and already had their story together. And I kind of saw what a powerful story could do in Marknology, my agency business, um, completely different story. It's not, it's not the different brands we're working with. It's my story. It's our story. It's why we created this. And I think, um, you know, our story has come about from talking to thousands and thousands of sellers over the course of 11 years of doing this, um, and, uh, hearing what their problems are, hearing, hearing what their needs are, hearing what Amazon's done for them and seeing those. So that became our story with Marknology. Um, I really just had people push me to, to just tell my story and, you know, share what we were doing. And that was really the story that came, that came out of it. It was authentic. Uh, something I used to think like, no one wants to hear my story. No one, it's easy for me to tell other people's, um, but when I leaned into that and I had some coaching and some mentorship kind of push me to do that, oh my goodness, it was so much more, it was so much easier to be authentic, whether that's your product, whether you're the product or you're selling a product or whatever. I think when you're thinking about story, as authentic as you can be, that is the way to go and start because whatever you create from that point on um, is better than, than a, a great story that's fake, number one. So I, you know, I just really think that's, that's the case. And when people are uncomfortable with, with that element of branding of, of that storytelling piece, a lot of times they pull away from it um, and they don't lean into maybe their strongest strength as, as a product or why they made it. For example, um, a local brand we work with here, it was a kid, uh, he went to, to university to learn how to be a, a mechanical engineer so that he could develop a product for his dad that allowed him to have a more functional life with these more functional uh, um, crutches, okay? Some higher end premium crutches, some forearm crutches, and they do all of the bells and whistles. And it was a beautiful story and an easy product to sell. Why? Because it was truly made from a son going to university to become a mechanical engineer to like spend more time with his dad. And so, you know, those are the things that when it's authentic, it's just so, so, so easy. Um, I would say if you're not starting there and you don't know where to start, um, read a lot of other good stories. Uh, you know, I, I honestly started creating for myself problems for myself before I started those for others. So it wasn't my story, but it would be like, put myself in the shoes of of the people saying no to me, uh, to Marknology, or put myself in the shoes of someone uh, that wants to stay in this Airbnb. Would I stay here? Uh, and so that was for me as someone that like travels and and tries to experience new things. That was the easiest for me to start with was my taste, I guess. And then from there, it obviously became easier as I coach and helped others kind of do that over and over and over to be able to see that for others as well. But I think a great place to start is is to consume great great content, maybe some great books. There's some great books out there, great podcasts um, and start thinking about your story first. Um, even you as an entrepreneur, why you're doing this, why you're creating this business in the first place. Is it to leave your nine to five? Is it to solve a problem? Um, and then from there, you'll get better at doing it for your products and, and so on. I know that's a little bit much, but um, there's a lot to that question. Yes, exactly. So those are great tips. Thanks for that. Vance, what about you? And you're an amazing storyteller, Vance. I mean, with your brand on Kickstarter, the way that you've um, you know created all the videos and the story behind the, the cups and everything, so that's absolutely amazing. But what does brand story mean to you? And do you have any tips for people on how they can create a story for their brand? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I think when it comes to storytelling, there's lots of different types of stories. And like uh, Andrew answered that question and told like almost like a dozen stories in telling this. And how much more memorable is that to someone than just listing a bunch of facts of do this, do this, do this, do this? So it's it's the way that we're pro really just programmed to understand as humans, and that's uh, 
it, it's what makes it super effective. So I think the idea with storytelling is that, um, like Andrew mentioned, to create something that's authentic. But at the end of the day, there's um, there's lots of different types of stories. So um, what Andrew described a lot in his examples were what we call founder stories. So there's mm -hmm. um, there's stories about people that started the company or the people that are um, going through this experience of building a product. And that's that's an awesome part of the story. That's generally one of the most relatable types of stories, but it's not the only type of story. So um, there's a lot of stories that when people talk about, for example, like the process that they went through, we call these like process journeys or process stories, where um, how did you figure out coming to inventing this product or launching this product or brand or what did you what did you what did you have to figure out to get to this point of iterations of uh, testing and of failures and that type of thing. And uh, when it comes to products, often this is actually a very appealing story um, because some people are, uh, you know, in that type of story, you can involve yourself as a protagonist, but you can also exclude yourself in which some, some people are not super comfortable with becoming um, like the face of the brand. So different types of stories might make that a little bit more accessible as well. Um, there's another type of story that we call um, like a vision story or like a bigger vision story. And a lot of these with brands that we've worked with, um, we run a agency that helps people. Um, well, we don't do the agency that much anymore, but we focus on helping people launch projects through Kickstarter is, um, is th there's a lot of, um, th there's a lot of uh, energy that it takes to enable people to be a part of a bigger cause. And this type of story is about what is it that we want to accomplish in the world and trying to get people, um, if it's a brand that's a, you know, creating like a new product that's really, really cool and they want to bring this to market or it's a brand that wants to contribute to the environment in some way and make a difference, how can you create a story that brings people into what you're doing so that they get really excited that they're just getting to be a part of it. So um, finding the right type of story that fits your situation uh, is going to be really important because uh, and, and also a, f a type of story that fits what you're comfortable with. And that's going to be really important in, um, in being able to tell that in a way that's going to be significant, meaningful, and also connects with your audience. Mm. Right. Vance, do you also think telling a story or, you know, adding a story about where your products are sourced from or maybe, you know, help helping communities in the country that you're sourcing from or in any other country, does that add more value to a brand? For example, Tom's Shoes, right? They uh, donate a pair of, uh, sneakers or shoes for every sale they make, um, you know, does that add to brand value in that? Does that also help you charge a premium price for your product? Um, well, so there's a nuanced answer to this, but I, I want to say that just the quick answer is that it, it can, and it can depending on who your target audience is. Sometimes this isn't necessarily relevant to all audiences. If you're selling something that isn't like the person that's purchasing this doesn't care about that that process of how it's handmade or that it's supporting a charity. Uh, I think most people care about those things, but in the off chance that you're selling to an audience that doesn't care about that, then that's not relevant to that audience. So it's important to consider, um, this is what we talked about earlier, uh, who your audience is, what resonates with them. And if you can incorporate those things that connect with them, some of the things that you talked about are really, really awesome for people that are eco-conscious, that, um, that care about contributing to others, that care about something like larger than themselves, and uh, that care about where it's made and the stories of the people that make them. Those are really awesome stories for the people that are interested in that type of, uh, of, um, of connection with that brand. So mm -hmm. um, I think the answer is uh, it definitely can, uh, but the nuanced answer is that, um, that you should understand who your audience is to understand if that type of story would be relatable or um, appealing to them. And in many cases, um, if it's appealing to them and they're, they're interested and they're, uh, they're really connected to the brand, this is where you can charge the premium that you're talking about, Megla, where they care about the, the cause and they want to, they feel mm -hmm. connected. So they want to, they, they don't mind to pay more because they really like what's happening. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Chris, what does brand story mean to you? And do you have any tips for sellers? Oh, look, for me, Vance um, nailed it. Uh, as did Mark. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Sorry, Markology. <laughs> sorry, just getting everybody's name mixed up. Um, the the founder story, I think, is one that's super duper important. Certainly from my experience, and uh, you know, looking at people like Mark Zuckerberg and and you know, it, it, who else have we got? Steve Jobs. I mean, these, you know, that there is such a connection between a brand it's, and its presence and its experience and its foundation. And a foundation story, I think, is super important. And that was the thing that really to Andrew's point earlier, really was able to sort of set me apart from other uh, sleep mask manufacturers, I suppose, uh, in building that brand, because I had such a good story to, you know, that, that really enabled that brand to exist. Um, and the second part of it really was the process story. And so um, having got some feedback on the very first iterations of the product, really they were prototypes, I was selling prototypes to people, um, getting all that feedback and turning those um, 
you know, those, those consumers, those customers into advocates because we were building their feedback into each new iteration of our products. And so we were really engaging with our customers, mainly through email again, because it was quite early days at that point, but later on through, you know, social media and, 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 and indeed crowdfunding in 2013 when we, when we launched like the, you know, the absolute bee's knees of, of all this work that we've done over the last 10 years to release that product um, onto Kickstarter. By then, we'd already had so many advocates. People knew the story. They were really aware of the brand and, and they really came along for the journey and really supported us. So um, it's just, yeah, I think the, the process and the founder story in reverse order, uh, are super important stories to tell. And then, of course, there are the other stories as well that you can kind of build on and perhaps can live on the edges of what is the core of, of the brand uh, in terms of its story and what it stands for. Cool. Okay, we've got Regla. a question from... Yes, Andrew. I just, wanted, I just wanted to add one thing there for anybody listening. You know, there was a couple in, in 11 years of this, there's several you know, light bulb moments, I think, that hit you whenever you're working on something obsessively for a long time and you're kind of just doing your thing, doing your thing, and then you have these moments that you're just like, wow, you learned something new. And um, for me, I launched a brand out of New York. It was um, these three ladies. They developed, uh, it was more of the like process story, I guess, um, in that they, the, the product, they had a product video that explained why the product and how it was created and was amazing. But on the product page on Amazon and the A plus, we had the founder story. So we were doing both really on the product page. Um, and I, after three years, I can say with very little advertising and very little off Amazon, uh, this was probably 2018 launch. So not in the sweet spot. We had a 48% conversion rate uh, ongoing, which is insane, right? So, wow. um, these are some things, these moments where I got it right. You know, it was kind of like the brand already had their story and we just gathered it together and put it on there. And then we saw the results and it was like, wow, this is absolutely incredible. How do we recreate this? What do we learn from this? You know, and just like that's what gets you diving in obsessively about something. Um, when something you're kind of dabbling with or working on, you finally get some kind of crazy result. You launch a product that just takes off to the moon and you're on your way and you start obsessing about what did we do that time? that really was all the difference. And this was a product that was um, more than double the price of the next one uh, of the competition. So we weren't the cheapest. Um, we were just connecting really well. It was connecting really well with the customers as Vance has been saying. We were with the right audience. We were making an emotional connection about cleanliness. Um, and these were the people that didn't mind paying extra to have this better product. And um, we, we nailed it. And so um, it's data like that that makes me really think about storytelling and creative and branding, right? It's, it's mirroring the two. Thanks for that extra minute. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, so, I mean, the fact that you were charging double the price, um, you know, that, that, I mean, that shows how important branding and storytelling is and how much, you know, it can benefit the overall business. Um, okay. So Gunther is asking, how can your brand help in connecting with your would be customers? So I guess potential customers, you know, how does branding help you identify new customers? I guess that's a question. So Andrew, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think there's question? a million ways to do this. Um, you know, depending on what you're selling, I, I like to think that I'm a, a real guerrilla warfare outside the box kind of like marketer. Um, you know, so for example, uh, I have an apparel brand. I'm wearing it. It's Landlocked Co. Apparel. It's a Kansas City brand based where I'm out of. Kansas Cityans are weird in that they love their city and they like to wear shirts and, and apparel that says that they love their city. Um, and, you know, if Landlocked, I also have an equality collection line that's just about um, we get into the inner city. It's all just about, um, you know, equality and doing good and, and being a good person. And we... Uh, this is a branding. This is what I was trying to use as an example. It's like we go out into the community and do things on behalf of Landlocked, which we're actually selling apparel and clothing. But we do things on behalf of Landlocked because it's aligned with our message. So in that aspect, it's we're out in the community um, under the guise of Landlocked, maybe sponsored by Landlocked, handing out waters uh, and, you know, doing different events like that. Uh, and that ties into our brand that strengthens our brand online in e-commerce in the city by the people that interact with us oh this brand is aligned they actually back up what they're saying with their message their clothing message so that's just an example like i don't want to take too much time 
but there's all these little things you can do. Those are would be customers, right? There's a lot you can do after you've had a customer and continue to follow up with them and continue to stay branded, but would be customers. Um, the same thing that you're saying, you could have a, an influencer that's, uh, you say you have the best basketball shoes around and you're coming out with these new high top shoes and then you have the best basketball player out wearing those shoes. That customer is then interacting with your would be customers for you and saying, hey, these are this is a great basketball player and he's wearing these great basketball shoes. It correlates to your customers saying, hey, this is a great product. So things from influencers, things from being out in the community, um, all types of ways, really, that you can co-market. Okay, great tips there. So now let's talk about specific uh, products that you have launched, um, you know, recently, all three of you have, of course, launched a lot of different products. But Vance, um, I want to ask you about your coffee cups. And uh, what are some of the branding strategies that you implemented when you were um, launching that product? Cool. Great question. Um, this is this could be like an hour long conversation, but let me just boil it down. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe several hours. Um, but so for those of you watching um, that are not familiar with the product, it's essentially a coffee glass that makes coffee uh, smell and taste better. Sounds ridiculous. Actually works. Um, but this was a little bit of a challenge because we're creating a completely new product in a category that didn't exist. So this product category exists in the wine world and the whiskey world, um, and we wanted to break this to the coffee world. So we uh, we essentially just designed and made these uh, glasses from scratch, from, from scratch essentially. So um, this required a lot to be able to really bring a product to market with no existing uh, market demand. So branding was especially important to be able to do something like this. So um, what was important for us um, in terms of creating this whole experience um, there's a handful of things, but one of the most important things was for us to build this um, this identity for the person that's going to be purchasing our product. So this person wasn't going to be the person that is making instant coffee um, because these glasses are really expensive. In some cases, $30, $32 a glass. Um, you can go to the dollar store and get a glass for a dollar. So it's not, um, you know, there's if you're paying 32 times more for a glass, there has to be a reason why somebody's doing this. So we created an aspirational identity, uh, what we call aspirational identity for our, um, our target customers uh, the, that we call the coffee adventurer. So an aspirational identity is how uh, customers can see themselves if they were like looking up to a hero. And the coffee adventurer was somebody who was super excited about um, trying new coffees. They saw themselves as um, you know, appreciating the finer things. Um, willing to take risks and um, and spend money on trying something that's different, um, wanting to share with their friends when they see cool stuff. So all these different types of attributes allowed us to define what we how we wanted to brand this product for this audience. So in using this, we we created a really really premium brand around this. Like when it com comes to the way it's presented, all the photography, uh, the unboxing experience, like the box itself costs like almost two dollars like it's a really really expensive like everything in, in in terms of creating that experience was top notch and very very premium and this was very very much in line with the type of person that would um that that would be interested in this when they um, when they saw themselves as like their ideal hero and uh and one final thing that we did we knew these people were going to be very well educated and um, that they were going to be um you know they're going to be asking a lot of critical questions if they're going to look at a coffee glass that's going to make their coffee smell and taste better so we actually worked with um almost 100 different influencers um in in the world of coffee so these were credible coffee influencers that um that essentially were um and they they were the they were the best of the best in the country and in the world when it comes to uh, coffee sensory and coffee preparation and we got them involved in the project to give us feedback and uh, and involve them in a way that um, that made them feel like they were part of the project and we used them not only to um, to get credibility for the project but also involve them in the brand and um, and also these people were eventually people that were helping us drive traffic to this um, you know to 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 our campaign so. Um, yeah, so there's lots of things to, 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 to kind of iron out there, but the idea is it, it's the foundation of understanding who your customers are and who they want to see themselves being and and using that as a way to um, to, to determine the approach of how you want to position and present this product. So um, that goes from a dollar glasses to $32 glasses um, on the expensive end. So um, those those are just some of the few things that um, that we can uh, that, that I can draw your attention to at this point. Uh, but the conversation goes deeper <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that okay yeah and this is i'm just uh, sharing the web page over here this is a kickstarter campaign for uh, vance's 
cups and you just did an amazing job of showing all the benefits. I mean, even though it's just a simple coffee cup, right? I mean, who knew there could be so much to a simple <laughs> coffee cup? So absolutely incredible. Guys, definitely check this out. Just search for Avensi on Kickstarter and um, check out their amazing story. So Chris, let's talk about your uh, new product that you're developing. Now you, you have a new, uh, can we talk about that? Can we mention the product? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course we can, of course, yeah. So this is uh, <laughs> uh, this is an interesting one. It's I've kind of partnered with some um, some friends and some expert uh, audiophiles in and manufacturers in China on this project. So it's called the Hi-Fi Box. Um, Vance, I've been working with um, quite tightly over the last year or so since we. In fact, I've been working with Vance in the Playground Theory, live my playground. So anybody that's looking to crowdfund a pro project, get in touch with Vance. Um, so. The, the folks in China, uh, Philip in particular, had, has created a, an amazing Bluetooth speaker specifically designed for audio files uh, where the quality is just absolutely incredible. The sound is amazing. And so what we're doing at the moment is um, we're just finished, we're finishing off our video at the moment for the crowdfunding campaign. And so at the moment, we're still in the brand building and development phase. So there's not really anything to show. Uh, as such, but we we know how, who our audience is, and that they are high end, quite wealthy audiophiles. That and so we've created a, a beautiful Bluetooth speaker. It's not one of these sort of plastic kind of Sonosy thing, you know, that sort of product. It's more something that you'd be really proud to have uh, in your home because it looks gorgeous and it sounds amazing. Um, some of the things that we've been doing, apart from all the research into who are who is our target target audience, and who in fact who are our target audiences. Um, We've also been going out and talking to, to Vance's point, influencers to understand um, and, and try and get feedback on our product, as well as celebrities as well. So we've been able to uh, send free uh, prototypes, I suppose, to, uh, to celebrities such as Paul Brown, who's a, an amazing um, uh, Trump, uh, musician, as well as Jerry Albright, too, who's also a Grammy Award winning musician as well. And so they've both had a listen and they're very happy to put their image and their name to the product as well. So we're trying to build uh, the, you know, the, I guess the comfort in the brand. We're going to be launching on Kickstarter in the, you know, in the coming months. Um, and so all of that is, uh, is starting to come together at the moment. So I don't really have anything to show, as I said, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the sort of phase we're in at the moment. There is also a risk as well. This project won't succeed on Amazon. Oh, sorry, on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, so we don't want to invest a huge amount of money. We're kind of running pretty lean on this brand development at the moment. Uh, but yeah, we're pretty confident that we'll, we'll smash it out of the park when we when we hit Kickstarter. Cool. Looking forward to hearing more about it when it launches. Me so, too. Andrew, uh, do you, <laughs> um, Andrew, what about you? Do you have any examples of uh, products that you have launched? recently and what are some of the branding strategies that you used uh... yeah so i am working on some of my own brands but we you know we probably are launching four to five brands a month here as a team uh at marknology so um some of them are our creations from scratch some of them we're partnering with someone that's already got a product and they just need the marketing arm and others you know we're just we're just the marketing arm so we we get i think one advantage to being in the agency space is just the number of attempts uh, that you get across different categories and products versus like, you know, you have a finite amount of resources when you're spending your own dollars. So, um, you know, we just get more attempts, more failures, more failures, more lessons. Right. And I think, um, you know, working with different brands through the years, they all bring a little bit of secret sauce to the table as well. For the most part, there's a reason they're a brand. There's a reason they're there. And they usually have stuff to kind of share with us as well. Um, some of the things I wanted to mention, just like some practical tips would be um, we use PicFu. Uh, I'm no I'm no ambassador of them or when uh, there's other ones that like that. But uh, PicFu is a great way to, you know, set up six photos or so with a good test. Uh, test market and you'll essentially get amazon customers in your in your um in your buy window i guess so to speak that will say hey i like this blue photo this yellow one i couldn't tell what was going on or the picture with the baby um is really the one that caught my attention and you'll actually get customer feedback for really a couple dollars um that can be impactful mm -hmm. greatly in your success or not um that's just a little tip another one would be um 
you know, the, the advertising data is a way uh, that we really dial it in. So it's not about being perfect. It's about, you know, launching with good photos, great research SEO, if we're talking Amazon, okay, and a great product page. And then ultimately launching with advertising. I'm talking about advertising PPC on Amazon. And with the keywords, you're then validating how your listing is doing. Okay, so this is this is like the early stage, almost like a phase one. Um, you know that you're going to need changes. You know that you're going to need to reoptimize. You know that you're going to need to pivot in some ways because it's not absolutely perfect. And instead of being perfect, you treat it as almost like Amazon does, uh, where they launch stuff and you have to figure it out as you go. Um, and it's not about getting bad reviews. That's not what I'm talking about. It's about dialing in exactly who that customer is. Okay, this photo didn't resonate as well. When I swap this photo out, we get better results or these exact 10 keywords um, get me more conversion. And these are things that as we determine who that customer is, we can actually get more accurate at, at speaking to them directly. Um, so I'll talk about a couple of brands just real quickly. I, we, um, we purchased a little baby brand me, me and a, a partner of mine. And, you know, it's easy for me to come to the table because I have everything from fulfillment to photography to design to Amazon management. So I'm trying to make plays almost like an aggregator, but a bootstrapped guy doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, so this brand was it had a great product, great reviews, decent sales, uh, you know, several thousand a month just to show you the size of it. So it was a several thousand a month, three SKUs just kind of cruising along. And we saw that it was missing packaging. So, um, you know, our focus was really kind of take this product, evaluate the competition. We read a lot of our competitors' reviews uh, as well as our own reviews, but we went through competitor reviews um, just to see what their customers were giving them as good feedback or bad feedback. Why, why reinvent the wheel when we can simply go out there uh, on the web and get all kinds of information right there from customers buying products just like it? And so, um, you know, we went out there and, and a big thing was the packaging. They wanted it. A lot of times this was a gift. Uh, it, so it, this is like a baby towel, kind of like bamboo hooded animal towel and uh, that you get for a newborn. And um, because it was typically a gift versus the mom's not buying it for herself, it's a gift that's given. We thought, what better experience than to create a package, a box that's ready to gift. So our messaging and our branding then became gift ready type of type of mm -hmm. gift. And that stood, that helped us stand out from the other competitors selling a similar product. Um, that was one that I think was kind of just really fun and outside the box in the way that we approached it. Um, another one would be, I'll, I'll give one more tip. We, we have another product kind of inherited this one. It was like, if you can get it to sell, be my guest kind of, kind of deal. And it was a, um, a foot rest. Okay. So it goes under your desk and you put your feet up on it, keep them elevated, keep it soft. And this is, this is a product that's been done before. They were a little, um, they believe that the product was better than everything else out there. But if you start looking at search results on foot rest or cushion foot rest, you're just going to see a, a lot of foot rest with some two feet on it, maybe like attractive feet or unattractive feet, just sitting there kind of perched. There's only so many ways to show these photos, right? Maybe one has socks. And uh, how do you make a product differ? How do you tell a different product story than everyone else out there when you have a product that's just like everyone else? And uh, kind of went outside the box. The name was called Comfort Hero. And uh, I thought, what better than to just create this, make up this new, uh, this new hero, this animated hero to go with our product. Um, and so he is the hero of comfort. And so our messaging and our story around the whole product been, was about him saving the day, um, you know, by saving your feet, getting them elevated, this comfort that he creates and the other products around it. So those are just a couple of real life scenarios of how do you get outside the box if you find yourself with a product that you know you thought you were alone and now you see that there's a whole bunch of other sellers and competitors or you're slow to the market or get delayed or um, sometimes you have to pivot and um, your imagination is your best friend you know it's a way to stand out we've seen great results you know we've seen several ticks in conversion rate which if you're talking about a year's time or that's just one move you know three points in a conversion rate can be a massive mm -hmm. difference so um, what's a way you know your first photo affects ads it affects um it affects search results, people clicking on it out of a listing, a group of other listings. So do something to stand out, obviously, within Amazon Terms of Service. That's assumed. Um, but what are ways that you can stand out? Is it, you know, painting the toes of the girl on the, on the you know, on the footrest and with something clever and, and, you know, in the toenail paint that gets people to click on it and they want to zoom in and, and see what you're trying to sell them through the, the toenail paint? There's just so many ways you can kind of get creative. Um, 
to bring your your story out and pop. And um, it, a lot of times, fresh eyes are the key to, to everything. So like Vance was saying really earlier, like take yourself away from it, get your friends, family, even go pay like a pick foo or someone like that mm -hmm. to really give you their honest feedback. Remove yourself from the emotions of how you feel about your photos and your story overall and say, hey, uh, I actually think there's a service now that will buy your product from start to end and score and and score you on on your branding across across the ch as the product goes from ordering to get to them and give you a score and kind of give you areas for improvement. I think that's a new service coming out um, from Isabella Hamilton. So I'll give her a little plug. She's she's just a brilliant mind in the industry. Um, but if you don't know, if you don't even know what good branding is, let's say you're someone that hasn't been exposed to that much or you're you're someone selling to an international market that you don't know a lot about. You have to get some research. You have to get some um, feedback from from that culture, you know, like selling to the German culture. It's a completely different game uh, localization than selling to the U.S. culture. And if I'm selling on Amazon Germany, I don't need to care about emotion. I need to speak facts mm -hmm. on my listing. And if I'm speaking to the U.S. culture, they care about emotion. So th there's so much to this, guys, that I, I just absolutely love it. I'm passionate about it. But um, it's really just about digging in deep and, and trying to figure out how to make every little part that you're touching better. That's amazing. Really good insights over there, Andrew. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, incredible. Okay, so let's start wrapping up here. And uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you if you had to give one tip to Amazon e-commerce sellers in terms of you know how they can improve your branding, what would that be? And uh, Chris, do you want to go first? Oh God, I don't think I've got one now. <laughs> I think um, it's, it's, it's look on Amazon certainly. Oh, it's, uh, okay. so Chris has already given it. too much. Oh no, I just think, I yes. mean it, it, it's particularly with Amazon. It's the copywriting, it's the imagery, and you know, and it's the and it's the experience as well. The the customer experience that you can offer. So I'll leave it there. Vince. Um, I, I think I'm in a similar situation to Chris. Like we've, uh, a lot of it has been covered. If I were to summarize, like the most important thing, understand your audience, and um, and this is going to set the foundation for everything. If possible, um, build a community of your audience uh, members, and that's going to be a really good, great starting point. Even if it's five people, ten people, um, getting started with some type of foundational community of this audience is going to be everything because you're not just relying on guessing and people that like uh, people that don't know about this niche. Understand your community. Uh, understand your audience, build a community if possible. Um, that's that would be the best place to start. Andrew will know the yeah. answer to this as well. But the the best search terms that you can advertise on are brand search terms. They are so they convert like crazy. So building a brand, getting the awareness around your brand is just absolutely vital. It makes everything so much easier um, down the track. Andrew, one tip for Amazon sellers. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come with a unique one. I gotta save some stuff for tomorrow's presentation. So if anyone's listening, I hope you guys I see you guys tomorrow. I'm gonna be telling some more stories. Um, mine would be um, know the difference in um, what you're selling in regards to do you need to focus on demand capture or demand generation? And what I mean by that is demand capture is people are already looking for um, uh, enhanced coffee cups. OK, I don't know what the exact word of that is, Vance, of what you're selling that happens in the wine industry. But let's say they're already looking for it. Um, that's demand capture. And you're creating a product that gets the people already looking for that to your product. If you're in demand generation, which is actually harder on Amazon, a lot easier on a D2C platform um, or Facebook ads or things like that, where you can you can market it in a different way. If you're in the demand generation um, product type then you really have to spend a lot more time on educating what your product is and cross marketing and cross selling so um, it's just a lot harder lift it can be a blue ocean because you're creating demand for something that doesn't exist and you'll be out in front but it's a heavy lift and if you're not a pro i would stick i would stay away from these demand generation type of areas at least without getting help and i would focus on demand capture um, it's a great place to start learning for someone new Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chris, Vance, Andrew, for a very insightful uh, conversation over here. I'm sure our audiences um, got a lot of tips and advice from you. So thank you very much for your time today. And uh, Vance and Andrew, we'll see you. Vance, we'll see you in a couple of hours <laughs> for your presentation. And it's Andrew, pretty we'll soon, right? Uh, like an hour. It is. 
Yes, like an hour. <laughs> exactly. <Amazing. laughs> cool. So yeah. if anybody's here and, and they're interested in around. crowdfunding watches, feel free to join me in about an hour. Yes, definitely. It's it's a very interesting presentation. I'd highly recommend it. <laughs> All right. So thank you Bye so everyone. much, um, everyone. And we'll see you around. Bye. Okay, so there we go. Um, let's move on to our next session. And before that, I'm going to add, um, oops, where is, oh, there we go. <laughs> Karen, Hi. Chen, my co-host. Hi, Karen. How's it going? Hi, Magla. Is, everything's great. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, cool. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We're off to a good start. So, all oh, right. Yes. So, Karen, over to you. What have we got next? Sure. We have Belinda, our event partner. Hi, Valinda. She's from TechPack and she's our event partner for this summit. Good morning, Valinda. Well, it's your afternoon, right? Your Hi. evening. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yeah, evening. Evening for me. Yeah. So, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you. How are you? Great. Um, well, first of all, I have to say thank you to Belinda for um, joining us at the summit this, for this edition and also being our event partner. Um, just to recap, actually, Megla mentioned this earlier. TechPack is offering us 10% off for all the products and services on their website. So you guys can listen to all the great ideas Belinda have for product development, and then you guys go visit her website afterwards, okay? Um, so Belinda, why don't you go ahead with um, your topic, The Secret of Mastering Product Development, and then... I'll be back when you're done. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, see you in a bit. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you tell me if you can see my slides? There we go. Okay, brilliant. So today's topic is going to be the secret to mastering product development. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Belinda. My company is called TechPax Co. And we provide technical design services to independent designers and small fashion brands. We're a small team of three. And we help brands go from design to production as seamlessly as possible. So, I'm wondering if anyone here has much experience with product development. Um, and I'm wondering if you could pop in the chat for me what your experiences have been like and if this meme is gonna resonate with you at all. So um, apologies to Leonardo da Vinci for doing horrible things to this amazing painting. Um, but I'm hoping some of you guys can identify with this experience of you know going from prototype to revised sketch to first sample and then all of that looks wrong and you start from the drawing board and you go round and round and round and there's just loads of back and forth and confusions and and it's not all smooth sailing shall we say um yeah from what i hear this is a pretty common experience for people who are new to product development um so let's talk about how we can create our own system to really master product development and you know streamline the whole process from start to finish so when you think about mastering product development how how do you want it to look what do you want the process to be like how do you want it to feel the thing that i hear from brands the most is that top priority is making sure that everything is profitable and that you stick to your product margins right you want to um you want to keep those margins you don't want to spend too much on development you want your product cost to stay stable the third thing i hear a lot about is speed so do you want to take ages in development? Do you want to sort of go around in circles or do you want to really just sort of barrel through as quickly as possible um, and get speed to market um, and be able to work with your factory seamlessly and easily, right? And the third thing I hear about a lot is simplifying development. So how do you cut down on the iterations, cut down on the back and forth and the meetings and you know get to production as easily as quickly and as possible 
So these are kind of the three main lenses that we're going to talk about development through. Um, those are the three main three main goals. So there are three three different tools, I guess you can call them, for um, getting your your development um, up to scratch. And the first we're going to talk about today is specifications. So what are specifications? These are basically quantifying details about your product and its dimensions and you know the weights and all the tangible necessities for your product right um so we'll come back to that in more detail but let's talk about the the second tool the second tool is having a blueprint for your design so clearly showing your design in picture form so that everyone can just you know actually see it and understand it and then the third tool is the system, right? So how are you going to take the specification and the blueprint and, and give them to your factory so they can start production? You know, it's not just a case of giving it to them, handing it over and then putting your feet up, right? You need to have a conversation and you need to have checkpoints for quality. Um, so how do, we, how do we do all of these three things? I'm going to go through all of them in, in a bit more detail. So specifications, right? The first and most important thing in, a specific, in the specification is your materials. So you're going to want to really clearly specify all of the materials that go into your product, right? Um, so not just the main material or fabric that it's made from, but you know, what goes on the inside, um, what are the trims that decorate it? What are the fastenings and the closures, right? And then think about all of these materials once they're listed out and, and what are they you know, made up of? Um, what are the dimensions and the weights and the thicknesses, right? Um, so you want to sort of get, get, really, um, get really detailed here and make sure all of the materials and their subsequent details are all properly listed out um because i should i should clarify this as well the material that you use in the final product will have such a huge difference on the quality and the feel of the product right so this is this is something you really want to focus on first in your specifications um, and make sure you get right and then the next thing you want to go through in your specifications is the measurements of your product right um, you know, how long is it going to be? How wide is it going to be? Um, how deep is it going to be? And, and not just, you know, the obvious dimensions, but, you know, again, you want to get really detailed and make sure every small detail has its own point of measurement in the tech pack. And if your product comes in multiple sizes as well, you're going to make sure you're going to want to make sure all of those sizes have measurements specified as well. And then the last um, detail you want to going to add to your specifications are tolerances. And tolerances are given very small measurements that you add to your initial list of measurements that we just talked about. And they allow the factory to be just, just a fraction, a tiny shade um, away from your original measurement. So you might have for, let's say a measurement of 10 centimeters let's say you have a purse it's 10 centimeters your tolerance would say the length of the purse is allowed to be 10 and a half or nine and a half right that's okay but if it's 9.6 no not cool we're not accepting that we don't consider that to be accurate and to spec so that is not okay right and this allows you to um keep your product consistent and it allows the factory as well as you know they have humans making your product not you know generally not robots making your product right so they can make it uh, at a profit um and you know quickly and you know be 99 percent accurate but you also have this tolerance written down where you can say you know no this much off spec is not allowed um, so materials, measurements, and tolerances, those are the, the, the three main things that will go into your specifications. So now let's talk about the blueprint for your products. Um, 
you think of a blueprint, the first thing that comes to mind is drawings, right? So you're going to obviously want to include a lot of drawings in your blueprint to describe your products clearly. Um, so not just the front, but you know, the back and the top and the side and the other side um, and, and think about how your product is being used and all of the views that the factory is going to need to see. So, you know, what does it look like from the inside of the front or the inside of the back, right? And you're going to want to keep these drawings very professional. Um, you know, don't make them into beautifully um, artistic illustrations, just keep them plain, technical, you know, draw them to scale, make them accurate. Um, and the, the saying a picture of what is worth a thousand words couldn't be more true here. Um, the people making your products, um, they might not speak English, they might not even be able to read in their own language, even if the tech pack is translated. So you really want to just provide as many really clear drawings as you can, um, because that's simply the best way to, to explain your products, really. Nothing else beats a drawing. And what else do we have? So the second thing that can go in your blueprints are instructions for assembly, right? Um, it's really important to communicate how to put your product together. So it's going to have multiple joins on the product, right? How, how is each join constructed? What does the join look like? Um, if it's going to be stitched, if it's a textile product, what stitch are you using? What width of stitching are you using? How many stitches per inch are they going to be? You know, what, what's the construction of the join? Does it look like this or does it look like this or this? So you really, again, want to get really granular and detailed and list out every join and what's involved in, in, in every detail of that. And then the last thing you can include in your blueprints is, what do we have there? We have drawings, assembly, and packaging. So the packaging is really interesting. I find that's always something that, that people who are new to, to development um, forget about. Um, but you also want to add um, instructions and drawings for your packaging, right? So you don't want your products to just come in a box with no protective packaging. Um, you want you might need tags added on there, you might need labels on there, you might need bags, you might need UPC codes, um, all of these different things. So yeah. Uh, an important thing to remember is to detail all of your packaging needs as well in this blueprint. And then we can talk about the system for actually delivering a blueprint and specifications to your factory. Because like I said, it's not necessarily just a one and done thing. Um, you don't get to send send this documentation to your factory and, and put your feet up after that and just wait for, you know, finish production to arrive at your door um, you're going to want to um, follow these three steps for the system so first of all is design right um, before you get too detailed and too technical just make sure that you've really thought through the design of your product well so how do you want the product to function um, how is your customer going to use it um you know what are the scenarios for different use cases um you know what does it look like when your customer is using it um what are the features it needs to have you know um what colors does it have to come in take the time at this initial design stage to really properly do your research think through all of the concepts and make all of all of these big design decisions before you get into Kind of the nitty gritty of the technical stuff um because otherwise you will waste so much time and money later when you've sort of started getting into the details but because you hadn't figured out something from the previous step that was kind of um like more of a general detail um you'll kind of find yourself getting stuck and going back and forward and back and forward so yeah i would say Decide on your overall concept, get it down on paper, even if it's just, you know, a napkin scribble, it doesn't matter. Just make those kind of important design decisions first. And then the second step is to 
get to the technical stage. So this is what we've just been talking about, putting together specifications and blueprints for your product um, and thinking through all of those detailed decisions like materials and, and measurements and you know exactly what the product is going to look like from all the angles and things like that right and now at this stage once you're getting detailed this is when you're going to want to start documenting everything so that you can have everything in one single place and you're going to want to keep everything in one single document so that you can have this kind of ultimate source of truth for your product and everyone in your team and everyone who works at your factory and everyone who works at your second supplier and your other material supplier everybody's on the same page about your product because all of the documentation is in this one place um, and not only will that keep you organized now it will keep you organized you know another year another two years down the line when you know everybody's forgotten about all of these development conversations but you might be you know a year into production and on your second and third production run and you know things can start slipping but they won't because you've got everything in this clear technical document this one source of truth so yeah you've got design and technical those are the first two steps of the system and then lastly we've got your evaluation process at the end so when you send all of your technical specs and the blueprint to your factory and they come back to you with a lovely sample and you get it in the mail and you open it up and you're like oh hang on a minute before you get too excited you should evaluate that sample so check all of the details against the specifications and make sure everything has been um everything has been done correctly just as you wanted it that's sort of step a of the evaluation process and then b in the evaluation process would be to also actually test your product and test the sample and you know use it and wear it and feel it and um, see what it looks like out in the wild and once you've done a and b it's likely that you're going to have you know a list of a few small things that need to be corrected or need to be reworked or can be improved and those should all go back and be documented in this one technical technical package that you have with all of the info so i've got a little loop symbol at the end here so the technical and the evaluation phases at the end of your system they kind of loop around a couple of times so again you might go back to the technical stage and you know add to your specifications um add you know send your factory some comments about the sample um you know add some new specs maybe change some things um but then at that stage you're going to want to go back to your factory and say you know here's the new info can you make us another sample um and you can rinse and repeat that process as much as necessary but hopefully it won't be necessary to do that too much because you've been really clear with keeping all of your info in one place and you've been updating that information. Um, so you should be able to kind of sail through and cleanly and smoothly go into production as easily as possible. And there you have it. You've got the secret to mastering product development, which is the three stages we've just talked about. You've got your specifications, you've got your blueprints, and you've got your system, which is design technical and evaluate so that's our our little process um i'm hoping megla will let us let me sorry answer any questions that the audience has right now um megla would it be okay to do that yes absolutely so great presentation belinda thank you so much for that and uh, yes. guys let us know if you have any questions for Belinda, I think tech packs, um, you know, I feel that this is something that a lot of uh, e-commerce sellers, they kind of underestimate the value of a tech pack. And uh, once they start product development, especially if it is a, you know, an apparel or a textile based product, 
Um, it's it's just so easy for things to go wrong. I love the meme that you showed at the beginning of the presentation. That was just so uh, incredible. And I have seen that happen just so many times when products are being developed, you know, regardless of where you're sourcing the product from, anything can go wrong. So yeah, I mean, having a tech pack just makes things so much more efficient and so much easier for the supplier and for um, the, the buyer as well. So yeah, great insights there. Uh, I don't see any questions over here uh, from people, but I wanna ask you a couple of questions, Belinda. So I'm just going to remove your slide. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see people making? Um, of course, one of them is not getting a tech pack, <laughs> you know, right away, but um, people that, that do get a tech pack, like what are some of the mistakes that you see people making, um, you know, in creating a tech pack? Mistakes in creating a tech pack. Um, yeah. I would say that the first one that comes to mind is not, um, is not being systematic about how you actually use the tech pack, which was kind of the, the third part of what I was, was talking about. Um, so it's not just, you know, have a tech pack done, send it, your, send it to your supplier and be like, oh, see ya, you know, everything's fine now, we're done. Um, you need to actually go through a sampling and development process with your factory using the tech pack as the documentation tool to, you know, move slowly through that process. So any changes that need to be made, you've got to go back and actually update your tech pack. Um, make sure it's always up to date with any, you know, changes that happen to your product, whether it's, you know, new materials or new specs or, you know, new colors for that season, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I, I think maybe people who are new to the concept don't realize that it's a, um, you know, a document that can evolve with time. Um, it's not just one and done in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And um, do you see a lot of, you know, e-commerce sellers actually using tech packs or is it still difficult to, you know, convince them of the importance of a tech pack? I know that, you know, some of the more established brands and retailers, they understand the value, but what is your experience been with e-commerce sellers and, you know, especially new Amazon sellers were just launching a new product? Yeah, yeah. So, um uh the word tech pack is like a fashion industry word so i think a lot of people who are in e-commerce maybe haven't heard of it especially if they don't make clothing products if they make you know other textiles or homewares or whatever um yeah it is it is really hard to um demonstrate how painful the process can be when it goes wrong if that's never happened to you before um so yeah it, it's a it's a it's a tough one to explain but i mean you have to think about it from the point of view of um how you know what are your monthly sales um what is your you know expected profit from the products you know in the next year um what's your returns rates um what kind of reviews are you getting how long does it take you to go from design to development? And can you, you know, cut that time in half? What, what does that mean financially for your business? So, um, so yeah, it, it is a, uh, an investment at the end of the day, but you can do the maths on, on that return. And, and you will, you will see that, that it's worth it to do, um, to invest a little bit upfront to, um, make sure things run smoothly later and, and don't go wrong later um, and just kind of ensure yourself kind of from the beginning. Okay, we've got one question from Stella. I never knew that packaging was included together with the product development at that factory. I assumed I had to contact another vendor that specializes with product packaging. So Stella, it really depends. I mean, some factories do product packaging and you can just, uh, you know, get the factory to do it. Uh, but of course, you know, some factories um, don't do it in-house. They would outsource product packaging to another packaging supplier. And so if you do have a very specialized kind of packaging, then you can work directly with a, with a packaging company. But if it's a very simple box or packaging that you're looking for, then just let the manufacturer 
uh, deal with it. You know, it don't need to, you don't need to work directly with a packaging company. So I hope that helps answer your question. Belinda, do you want to add anything to that in terms of packaging? Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, as always, it kind of depends on your supplier and, and exactly what they do. Um, but yeah, generally, if, if they can't make the packaging themselves, they have somebody that they work with that supplies them with that, and they can then um, package your product into whatever that supplied packaging is and send it on to you if, if that's how you want to do it. Cool. All right, Karen, should we move on to the next um, session? Yes, um, I was just wondering, because uh, Belinda, you talked a lot about how TechPack helps a bus uh, product development, but can you talk more on how your company can offer to our audience, like the services and products that you have? Yes, yeah, like exactly. Yes, so your website or, yeah. Yeah, um, I was going to upload another couple of slides, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. I'm just, sure. So just, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go I ahead. I was just going to say just a reminder to everyone that uh, Belinda is offering a 10% discount on all of their products and services, but this discount is only available for the next 30 days. So you can go to their website, techpacks.co and uh, use the code global sources 2022. Okay. So, okay, so I see the, slide here okay there we go okay. um yeah so thank you karen um to answer your question we work with brands to really streamline their product development um so that would be through the creation of tech packs which we just briefly talked about before i was saying to megla to answer her question um tech pack is a fashion industry term it's a it means basically a blueprint of your product and it documents your design, your materials, your construction, all of the details so that your product kind of has this, this one source of truth. Um, so it's probably quite hard to visualize what goes in a tech pack. I appreciate if you've never seen one before. So I'll show you a couple of pages here real quick um, so you can get a, a feel for, for what it really is. Um, like I said, it's basically just a document, normally um, maybe between 10 and 20 pages. And we put loads of images in, loads of drawings, um, lots of you know arrows and call outs. And there's lots of pages that look something like this with lots of measurement descriptions and numbers on with all these various different measurements for different sizes of your product. Um, so yeah, like I said, it, they can be, you know, 20 pages long sometimes. So if you want to download an example, you can do that here. Um, just to really take your time to look through a, a whole example of what one is and see how you can apply it to your product. Um, so our website is techpacks.co forward slash examples is the page that you can go to 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 download some examples for yourself. Um, and really quickly, we can go through the benefits of a, a tech pack, which I kind of touched on before again. It's mostly, you know, what is, um, what what do you want to achieve in development? You want, you want to make it faster, you want to make it smoother, you want to cut your costs, you want to streamline everything, make sure you're not um, going over budget, that you're keeping to your margins and that you're not spending too much in development. You want to keep your keep everyone, all your suppliers and all the other stakeholders, you know, accountable so that they can see your design and you're minimizing communication and you're minimizing meetings and back and forth. And a tech pack can also be sent to your QC team for them to use as well. Um, so there are many, many different benefits for getting a tech pack and you will be using it along all the different stop points of your development and production process. Um, so we've done hundreds and hundreds of tech packs for hundreds of different brands and our products have been seen in some of the following places. I was very excited to read about one of our products on the wire cutter because um, I love to get my product recommendations from there. And why would you work with us, Tech Packs Co? 
We are a small company of three people and we just focus on this one piece of the puzzle. So creating tech packs for brands and helping them to really speed up that process from design all the way through development to production. Um, so we're a tech pack, tech pack machine and we have a lot of very streamlined processes to keep our documentation simple, to keep your communication with your factory simple and to allow you to really manufacture anywhere without the stress and without the headaches. And combined, we have, you know, more than a decade or, or two of experience and we want to share that with, with brands and designers. And we can help you with things like sourcing connections as well and um, contacting suppliers. So yeah, that, that's us. Um, we do done for you tech packs. If you are interested in that, you can go to our website to read about that, which is techpacks.co. You can book a free consultation with us, which is that big blue button in the top right. Or if you are more experienced at product development and you've been doing this for a while and you have you know, your own good systems, we also have some digital downloads that you can buy and, and use yourself and that's at techpacks.co forward slash store um, so we have things like templates forms that you can fill in directories that you can use um, so you can use our 10 percent off code for, for both of those and yeah that's that's how you can um, work with us and that's how we can help you streamline your development um yeah but then can you tell us more about your workshops yes yeah we have a workshop in the store as well called um, start your first fashion collection and that workshop is for new brands who are trying to design their first product and it's really kind of um how do you do this step one of you know, getting the design right, picking the most commercial options, um, making sure that you've got the correct kind of product lineup. Um, and are you um, merchandising, you know, picking the right options? And so yeah, the, the workshop is really a kind of a, a stage one design class. Um, and it's about an hour long. And yeah, you can download it on the, the website for free and, and watch the replay of that, which we did live a few years ago. Nice. nice. We've got one question from Ronel. What is your average turnaround time on projects? It's about four weeks. Okay, four weeks. And um, do you require people to send you samples or like how does the process start? Do they just need to give you some specifications in a document or would you prefer to get like some sort of a rough sample? Yes. Yes, that's right, Megla. So we do have clients send to us a rough work in progress sample that shows us um, either a similar product to what they're trying to make or something that they've made themselves that's in a, a similar shape and in a similar fit. And that gives us a really good starting point on the tech pack and all of the specs that we're going to put in the tech pack. And it just removes some of the subjectivity that we would otherwise have if we didn't have that reference sample. And it's it's sort of a, a cheat step that, that means the first sample that you get back from a factory after you've done the tech pack, it's it should ensure that that sample is really spot on rather than if we'd sort of subjectively chosen the dimensions and the spec for you. Um, so yeah, we, we have clients send us a physical sample before we begin and we have clients send us any designs or drawings or reference images before we begin. And if they want to send us any other, you know, material references or color references, they can send us those as well. Um, but that's, that's pretty much all we need to get started. And, and we kind of handle, fill, we help the client fill in the rest of the details from there. Okay, that's great. Okay, um, so for um, those who are interested in Belinda's products, or if you want to get more information, don't forget to visit her website, that's techpack.co. And for audience from the summit, you'll get 10% off using the code uh, globalsources15.
2022. So thank you very much, Belinda. I'm sure people are going to start reaching out to you very soon and ask you for more information and how they can do better with their products. Okay, so um, thank yeah, you so thank you very much. So looking Thanks, forward Belinda. to seeing you again soon. See you around. See you Take around. care. Bye. 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 That was very interesting because that's a lot of information for me. I'm still trying to uh, <laughs> process it all. Okay, um, while I'm still processing, let me... We, we have a lot of um, suppliers from around the world. We have some from China, some from India to talk about their special products that they have launched recently and they want to promote. And um, here is one that's really good for both of us because um, it's a smart pillow that you... <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> Smart pillow. That should be interesting. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Hello. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Peter. Yeah, yeah Hi. we have Megla here as well. She's our co-host. And um, yeah, do you want to tell us more about your pillow? Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, I, okay. So yeah. Okay, so uh uh first uh, uh it's not this uh oh okay okay uh so first uh let me introduce the the air cozy inter interactive smart pillow and uh I think, uh, so sorry, uh, I think the the slide is wrong. It's not. No this, worries. This. How about how about um? Yeah. I'll play your video first while you look through your slides. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. We have a video from um Dozy Cozy, and you will get play to know and more listen about to your favorite music to sleep. Bluetooth playback from mobile devices. Sleep timer function. Built in five different natural white noises. Effectively help to fall asleep and improve deep sleep time. Effectively relaxes your muscles and relieves fatigue from work during the day. Yes, hi Peter. So okay, um, hi. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I upload the new. But... Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, I'm still waiting for your um, PowerPoint, but um, I remember your video is Bluetooth control and has different functions, right? Can you just briefly talk about it? Uh, okay, uh, sure. So uh, the the Elco's interactive smart pillow uh, is the most in the uh, innovative smart pillow. Uh, so the main features uh, of the Elco's premium at first is uh, it, it will 100% automatically adjust the height of the pillow to uh, accommodate the sleep position. So it's hundred percent. So whether uh, when you fall asleep, uh, you, you like to uh, sleep on your side or sleep on your back. So uh, you are just automatically adjust the perfect height for you. And it has two more additional function uh, is uh, you also have the music streaming. So uh, you can uh, play uh, any music or song you like to listen from your mobile device to fall asleep. And you also have five different uh, wide noises so uh it can uh, help you to fall asleep faster as well and you also have the sleep timer uh you can set the time to uh like 30 minutes one one hour or two hours uh and then you will turn off the the music automatically okay wow that really looks like that sounds like a very revolutionary product um so what kind of filling do you use in the pillow like is it a soft filling or is it you know a hard filling or can it be customized uh it's actually it's it's, it's uh as softness with the furnace as well so uh because mm -hmm. inside we have uh the the, the chassis so uh the foreign uh, we actually we make the form with our exclusive uh, formula so it is it, it, it mm -hmm. tastes like uh it feels like uh like a memory form so uh, and uh, the reason that we make the why why air cozy need to uh, adjust uh, the height by itself because uh, under our a lot of uh, health research it shows that uh, for the back sleeper uh, the people needs the higher and thicker pillow and for the back sleeper uh, they need thinner 
uh, pillow and lower pillow. This is so cool, like sleeping with tech, yeah. tech, just having a, a speaker <laughs> in, in your pillow and then with all the special function to make you sleep better and then also adjust its, its height. So then even when you turn around, it will still fit to your body and do good to your neck. Is that right, Peter? Yes, yes, correct. Okay, um, so for people that want to learn more about Dozy Cozy's um, special pillow, this is something really new to me, okay? Um, if people want to know more, uh, you can reach out to him at globalsources.com slash dozycozy.co. Yeah, um, he, um, Peter is one of our verified suppliers on uh, Global Sources platform. So do go on to the, um, the platform and then look for suppliers. And just a little reminder for everyone, since you're registered for the Global Sources Summit, you will also opt in for the a membership at our platform. So if you send him a message, if you send him an RFQ or RFI, you will get points for doing so. And then you can redeem a special prize or discount in your future purchases. Okay, so... Um, so we have one question from Ronel. Yeah. She's asking, what's the weight of the pillow? Uh, the weight of the pillow is uh, about like a five, five kilograms. Five kilograms. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, and also one more thing. Um, where do you? Where is your usual market so far? Or is this oh, so okay. new that it's just launched? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so far, uh, uh, right now, uh, because actually, Aircoast is covered by uh, the global patent. Uh, so it's including the United States, Canada, Europe, uh, Australia, Taiwan, Japan, and China. So uh, those are my our markets. And right now, because Aircoast is pretty new, so uh, we are planning officially to launch to the global market on the uh, season three of uh, this year. And the mm -hmm. first time that we, we will launch the Aircoast in Taiwan, Japan, and United States, and then we'll expand more markets to uh, maybe like Europe and other countries. And we also provide the OEM and ODM as well. Nice. Wow, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's incredible that Global Sources Summit attendees are really the first to see this very cool patented product that's not even on the market um, as yet. So that's absolutely incredible. And are there any certifications that are required for the pillow um, for the U.S. market specifically? Yes, uh, right now we, uh, we uh, Aircos is uh, certified uh, by FCC, and NCC and uh, also the TLEC. So uh, FCC is for United States and TLEC is in, uh, in Japan. NCC is in Taiwan for of the certificates. Okay, and you already and have later, all of those certificates. Yes, and later we'll do more more countries. Yeah. Nice. Uh, what's the approximate price? Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's one more question. Is it waterproof and what's the size? Uh, uh, no, it's it's not waterproof, and the size uh, is pretty much the 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 same. Um, I think uh, the size is about uh, like the regular pillow, so it's like a uh, sixty-five centimeter times I think thirty thirty-five. Yeah, I need to check the information. Sorry. Yeah. And that's customizable as well, right? If a buyer wants, uh, you know, the size to be smaller or bigger, or you bigger. can customize the size. Yes, the smaller smaller changes and the the shape of the pillow, uh, it, it can be uh, like a OEM or ODM. Yes, it can be customized. Okay. 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 Cool. So okay. that's really cool. So um, yeah, do reach out to Peter at globalsources.com, dozycozy.co. Thank you very much, Peter. We'll we'll hope to see you soon again. Okay. Thank uh, you. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Peter. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Yeah, that that, so that's cool. very interesting. It's so high tech. Yeah. I didn't know sleeping could be so high tech. I thought like um, I know. um like new mattress, like different material of pillow is really cool already. And he actually has like a speaker and a smart pillow. Yeah, that's so cool. I was gonna ask him, does it vibrate as well? Because it'd be nice to have you know like, like a wake massage. up to a gentle vibration, <laughs> a massage. Yeah, yeah, That'd neck be massage. Cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Okay, okay next so we next have supplier. Just yeah, Giselle Hello. from German people. Hi, Giselle. How are you? I'm good. Good. Okay. Um. So, do you want to tell us more about yeah. your product? Yes. Oh, uh, I have a slide. Okay. Here you go. 
You can okay, go ahead. Okay, sure that. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Giselle from Jamal Lipo. Lipo is the one-stop electronic manufacturing service provider for the screen protector. We established we established since 2003 and for now is 19 years. We are specialized in OEM and ODM quality protection solution, and we have advanced facilitates and stable technical personnel. And the most important, we are we gain the trust and are the assigned supplier of the screen protection protection product in the Apple stores. Let me introduce our products to you. This year, we have a, a eco-friendly solution for the tempered glass products. We will use the PLA degradable material and the RPET renewable material for the protective liner and the release liner, and also for the backing plates for the black flint tempered glass. And for the cleaning kits, uh, we have the we can we will use the cloth paper for the packing, wet white bag, and the dust removal sticker. And also the cleaning cloth is reusable. And for the packing balls, we will use one one hundred percent eco-friendly biodegradable paper. And for the paper, we will, we will have FSC coated paper or the FSC cloth paper. And we will use the soil bink in for the printing. Also, we are making the, we are making the TUV green product certification and we, and after we, after approval, we can you we can print the mark on the packing. Let me introduce our installation solution. Here is our automate automatic application. It is very easy to applicate the tempered glass for the mobile phone. And then we have the easy align train solution. This tray is made of RPET material. It is recycled and eco-friendly. And this, this tray is paper application tray. It's made of the cloth paper and it is degradable material. And we have the application flame and this material is biodegradable. It is made of the real straw. And it's self-installation in and designed for the temple glass. Then let me introduce the, our newest product to you. And this is invisible glass. It is only 0 0.08 mm thinness. It is very thin and super thin. When you use it, it just lies you. You don't have a tempered glass screen protector on your phone. Then we have the Alpha glass screen protector. It's five five times stronger than the common screen protector. And then we have the flexi steel glass. Next is our most cost effective products. It's the ultra clear and the black flint and clear screen protector. They are not hard. They are nine hard and is scratch resistant. Then we have the antibacterial 
for the clear, for the clear and the black plain tank tempered glass, and we also have the white tank of lysation. We, this can reduce the 99% bacterial in your in your food. And we have the two-way pro privacy protection for 180 degree. Then we have the, this is the black cleaning also. And we have the IKEA screen protector, which will help you block the blue light. And the last one for the clear and the Black cleaning is the anti-glare. Anti-glare, it will help you to uh, block some sun sunrise when you are in the outdoors. Here is our product introduction. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Giselle. Um, I just want to, I see that you, all your packaging are environmentally friendly, recycled yes. paper, soil bin milk, which is uh, ink, which is really good. And um May I know, do you have any MOQ for your products? Uh, yes, basically 3,000 pieces. For each, oh, okay, that's nice. Yes. And I assume you will have um, screen protector for most recent models of phones yes. in the market right now, right? Okay, that's good. Yes. Um, yeah, so, um, and I really like the idea of antibacteria as well because of all the recent <laughs> things in, in around the world right now. Okay. Um, so yeah, do reach out to Giselle at globalsources.com slash VIPO.co. And then you can see her whole range of products there. Okay. Thank you very much, Giselle. Thank you. See you soon. Thank bye, you. bye bye. See you next time. Okay. So we had two very interesting products just now. Yes, very and interesting. Then, yes. Okay, so next up, without further ado, because we're we're really running tight on time. <laughs> yeah, so okay, Megla, why don't you? Yes, yeah, so we've got Vance Lee coming back. And uh, Vance is, hi Vance, how are you doing? I'm, I'm good, it looks like I'm in a creepy dark room right now. It's, it's late over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's late at night there. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate okay. you staying up late. So, um, yeah, Vance, you're, you've got a very interesting presentation about um, how to launch on Kickstarter and how to generate pre-orders. So go for it. Do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Okay, we've got your slides here. So, I'm ready to go whenever. Yeah, we've got your slides. Let's let's go ahead and start. Okay, let's let's get started. So today uh, we're going to talk about how to sell pre-orders. Um, I say three, 30 to 200K pre-orders here before spending a dollar on inventory. So the goal here is to learn about the pre-order process that's going to be a very, very different process than our usual Amazon or e-commerce launches. And the idea here is we're going to use this as a way to eliminate launch risk and scale faster. So why do we care about doing this? What's the big deal? And why is this important? Well, uh, this is going to be a big deal for our business because if we're able to switch from a traditional launch model to pre-orders, it allows us to, first of all, eliminate risk and get orders before having to place an order for inventory. Uh, second, it allows us to execute profitable launches and allows us to be cash flow positive. And third, it allows us to start building a list of ready to buy fans um, that's going to help us scale our product launches and our brand. So. I'm going to be talking pretty fast today. There's a lot of information in this uh, in this presentation. I didn't want to cut anything else, so I fit it all in. So we're gonna we're gonna jump through this really quickly. And if there's a replay, feel free to uh, dive into the replay and uh, try to catch some of this stuff again. So um, let's get started. Um, I started in Amazon FBA in about 2015, and since then I've had a lot of successes, a lot of failures, uh, and learned a lot along the way. And through this process, I've discovered uh, crowdfunding, which is essentially a, a, a Kickstarter, Kickstarter is a type of crowdfunding platform. And since then, I've raised about $7 million in successful launches alone. So these are from launches itself. And with two of my own launches, I broke the record for the number one funded in the niches. And these both ranked in the number one crowdfunding projects of all time. So uh, really exciting to come talk to you about this alternative launch strategy. So the current reality of our uh, of the way the e-commerce looks right now, especially with Amazon, is that launches are increasingly more expensive and more risky. 
And this is happening because there's a lot of competition, a lot of really big players in the space. So really, as, a, as people that are launching products and launching, um, you know, launching new products at this time, what can we do that allow us to give us an edge against all these massive players that are really driving down profitability and limiting our ability to launch, grow, and scale? So that's what we're really going to talk about today. So before jumping into this, I'm going to address three common FAQs that I have when we talk about pre-orders and crowdfunding. So the first question is, uh, Kickstarter, is this another platform that replaces Amazon or Shopify? And the answer is no. Uh, Kickstarter is a launch platform. So this is going to be the first part of your new strategy that you're going to be implementing. And this is continuing the second question, which is, can you launch on Amazon and Shopify afterwards? And the answer is yes. So after Kickstarter, you have, all, you have a list of customers and you have all the creative assets you need to immediately launch on Amazon and Shopify or the channel of your choice. So it's really easy for you to move on to whatever platform that you choose. And the final question that I get often is, do you need a 100% revolutionary product or does this only work for X category? And the answer is no, um, you don't need anything 100% unique and it works for all categories and we're gonna have a lot of examples in this presentation. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. Who does this work for? If you're a beginner and you have not launched a product before, this is a proven strategy that helps you build really strong foundations for your brand with, while minimizing risk. Uh, if you're an advanced seller and you've launched products before, or even dozens of products before, and this is essentially an alternative launch approach that not only allows you to set the foundations for your brand, but also allows you to launch more profitably with less risk and gives you a sustainable way to scale your brand faster. So uh, how are we going to talk? Uh, how are we going to dive into this topic today? We're going to cover it in two different parts. So the first part is we're going to understand Kickstarter and pre-orders and why this is really the only way to launch and build your brand without upfront inventory risk. And so that's our first goal. The second goal is we're going to take a look at our process, which is called the Launch Accelerated Blueprint, or LAB for short, and how this is the only strategy that you can use to have a successful launch while at the same time building a community of ready-to-buy fans. So that's what we're going to focus on today in two different parts. So you'll want to stay for the entire thing because we're going to have an entire breakdown of our strategy, uh, Q&A at the end, and uh, we'll have a few bonuses for people watching today. So. Let's go ahead and get started. Part one, how Kickstarter works and how crowdfunding works and how this is gonna change your launches. So Kickstarter is a form of crowdfunding and crowdfunding is a little known e-commerce model that allows us to do pre-orders. And the idea is that customers get to pre-order a product um, with the expectation of getting it later on when it's manufactured. So for us, this means that we're using it to launch our product. It allows us to raise funding for our initial manufacturing production order, and it allows us to start building an audience. Um, and this is an example of a fountain pen ink that we worked with that raised $165,000, and it's just literally it's fountain pen ink. So uh, there's two main crowdfunding platforms. It's Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and both of these are in the category of crowdfunding. And I'm, from now on, I'm just going to say Kickstarter to keep it simple to, so we understand and we'll talk a little bit about Indiegogo later on. So what's special about crowdfunding customers or Kickstarter customers? Well, these are some of the wealthiest e-commerce shoppers that exist out there because they're willing to pay for a product that doesn't exist yet uh, with a chance that it might not get delivered. So this is uh, really interesting because uh, what this means is that they might pay $50, $100, a couple hundred dollars, and um, they there's a chance that they don't receive the product, but they're still ready to support brands that are launching through this platform. And at the same time, they're also early adopters and people that are really passionate about sharing projects that they're participating in. So this is a very, very unique set of audiences that are very different than the Amazon audience that's comparing you know, between a dollar or two dollars difference when it comes to making a decision for the order. So why is this favorable for sellers? Well, uh, the traditional model, we, we know how this works. So Amazon or traditional e-commerce or Shopify, you, order the, you, you place the order for inventory, uh, you get the inventory, you begin, and you begin your process to, to launch, and, and hopefully with Amazon, you begin to rank and you begin to, to, to develop consistent sales. Well, the Kickstarter strategy works very, very differently. So with Kickstarter, the first thing that we do is we launch a limited time campaign. So with this campaign, backers or customers are able to place pre-orders. So after the campaign closes, you get paid from Kickstarter within 15 days. Then you take this money and then you use this to place a manufacturing order. And once you get your inventory, then you ship it to your customers. So it's almost like we're reversing the way that this, um, this uh, the, the way we work with inventory and we work with cash. So this is an example of a bath towel that launched on Kickstarter. Um, it did about over 300,000 um, in sales and with 13 days remaining when we took the screenshot. So really cool example of a successful campaign. So with these two side by side, you can start seeing why Kickstarter is going to be a really massive benefit for us sellers when it comes to being able to launch. 
So what do you need to launch? Well, you need two things. First thing is you need a working prototype. So in this example, um, they had a working towel prototype. Or if you have another product, you have a prototype of that. And the second thing you need is a campaign page. So this is equivalent to your product listing page on Amazon or your product page on your Shopify store. Uh, and what you need for that is this really standard assets of photo, copy, and video. So these are all the assets that you need for a traditional launch. And it's important to note that with Kickstarter, you're not doing anything that's different than um, what you would need to launch on uh, any other e-commerce platform. You're just doing it first. And the only thing that you don't need in this situation, which is really special to the launch model, is that you don't need inventory in stock. So why is this a better launch strategy? There's lots of different reasons, but we're just picking the top five that we're going to go through really quickly here. So you have an idea of why um, this might be interesting for you to consider. So the first benefit is that this really flips the launch model upside down and eliminates risk. So with a traditional Amazon launch, we really invest a lot of inventory, uh, sorry, investment up front. And there's a lot of risk associated with the initial inventory, the launch, uh, the, the, the launch strategy and the giveaways and all that. And there's a chance that your strategy, your, your launch might not be successful. With our launch uh, lab approach, um, we all we need is a prototype and we're preparing all the same assets that we're gonna be using to launch on a traditional crowd, uh, any traditional e-commerce platform anyways. But we're able to get pre-orders in advance before spending a single dollar of inventory. So you can see how this flips the model upside down like we talked a little about earlier. The second one is related to risk, but it's, um, it's about profitability and cash flow. So traditional launches on Amazon are never profitable. We always see this as a sunk cost, um, and we hope that eventually when the product is successful, we recover the cost of the investment that we put in earlier. And really, we all do this all to rank, and we hope that it's going to be successful. And the problem with this is it's also a very, very cash flow poor model. So you're always going to be working backwards, and you're going to be trying to, to, try to catch up when it comes to getting back some cash. So with our, our launch approach, the idea is that successful campaigns are profitable immediately and you're profitable immediately, you collect the cash immediately, and that allows you to be cash flow positive right away. So you start off in a very, very different financial situation um, and that's gonna help you really, really scale your, your launches and your brand as you go forward. So those two are financially related benefits. The third one is to be able to build a list of what we call ready to buy fans, and this contributes to a long-term sustainable brand. So it's really difficult to build a brand on Amazon alone because your customers are not your customers, they're Amazon's customers. And at the end of the day, not having a list or access directly to your customers makes it really difficult to launch products, to, to scale your brand, and it really does limit the value and potential of your business. So uh, with our launch approach, really the one of the biggest benefits is that we once we launch in this way, we have access to this list of customers. These are our customers, so we communicate with them directly. We have their emails, and we're talking to them right away. So uh, from our first campaign, uh, where we launched our Arctic cold brew system, this raised almost a million dollars after upsells, um, we acquired a lot of customers. So these are the people that when we launched our second campaign for the coffee, coffee glasses that you see there, um, we obviously invited them to purchase our next product because we're launching. So it's really interesting that about 5% of these um, previous customers from our first campaign backed our second campaign. So they contributed to our second campaign. And that doesn't necessarily seem like a super high number, but when you look at it, this actually contributed almost $40,000 worth of sales when it came to this launch. So imagine being able to launch a product and right away have your existing customers purchase and contributing $40,000 of revenue to, uh, to your launch. This is something that's really unheard of when it comes to our traditional launch strategies. And that's why crowdfunding and Kickstarter is gonna be really special for a lot of these approaches. So the other thing that's going to be really valuable is establishing product and brand credibility. So um, successful Amazon launches don't necessarily produce any type of results or recognition off Amazon. You get reviews on your product listing page. But uh, a successful campaign on Kickstarter allows you to build PR buzz and credibility and social proof on other platforms off of, um, off of Amazon. So um, in our example with the Arctic um, Cold Brew Maker, we had a lot of people pick up uh, on this this product, they wrote about us, they wrote blog, blog articles, we were featured in lots of different places, and this allowed us to get a, begin building momentum off, uh, off of, um, well, really off Amazon, but really the idea is building momentum anywhere on the internet that's going to get, uh, allow us to be credible, and this is going to make a big difference when people start searching our products and searching our brands, and maybe they want to compare us with other brands. This is really a massive benefit in being able to do this. And finally, number five is to be able to create opportunities for diversification 
and for scaling. This is really important because we've all heard the stories about relying too much on one platform. And when that falls through, that affects our business in a way that's really, really significant. So um, what we do with uh, crowdfunding and Kickstarter is that this sets the foundation for us to be able to scale and be a diversified brand on the platform. So we launch on Shopify, for example, we sell on third-party websites. Um, we've even expanded to retail and wholesale distribution. And right now we're selling in about 17 countries where a lot of these distributors, they contacted us after finding out about us through the Kickstarter campaign. So um, really, really cool opportunities there. So these are the top five reasons why this is an interesting launch strategy that's appealing to a lot of e-commerce sellers. There's a lot more reasons. I'm not going to go into them now because we're limited on time. But for example, if you're launching a brand new product that's um, that's not necessarily have a lot of demand on Amazon at this stage, um, you can use this pro process as a way to not have to order an inventory and test and validate your product in a way that's risk uh, much less risky than having to order thousands of thousands of units or whatever it might be to, um, to hit your MOQ. So now that we know why this is a great idea, the next step is to go through the six step process of our lab framework. So um, before this, a little bit of background about, about my background, it was launching on Amazon was really challenging for me when I started in 2015. Uh, the biggest issue was that we didn't have a reliable launch strategy that was cash flow positive. So we never always we never had enough cash to continue cycling inventory. And the second thing was we weren't building a brand. So at the time I was in the kitchen niche and I launched a bunch of products. And it didn't matter that I launched product three or product four. People didn't know that this brand was a part of a, a bigger brand that had kitchen products. So this was a huge issue because it's almost like we're starting over from uh, from scratch every time. So. Uh, in my second year in Amazon, uh, lost a lot of money, and but that's eventually what led me to this uh, Kickstarter and allowed me to discover the process that we're um, that we built into the lab, uh, the lab blueprint that we're talking about now. So, uh, what are we doing with the lab blueprint? So, it's six steps, and we're going to walk through these individually, um, one by one. So, the first step is to determine your USP. So, USP stands for your unique sell selling proposition. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one because I think it's the most important one. So. Uh, Again, you don't have to create something 100% brand new, but you do need to find a unique angle or what we call positioning to present the product so that it's appealing to your target audience. So uh, this is an example of a category that's really saturated in Amazon, the cocktail shaker category. Uh, and these guys did a really good job at launching. Nothing really special here, but they, what they did was they really positioned this as a, a premium cocktail shaker. And they did about um, 470,000 uh, on Kickstarter when they launched. Um, this type of positioning works well for all types of categories. These are all different projects that we've worked with from apparel to, uh, to food to um, stationery and, uh, and kitchen, all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, and this is the framework that we use to determine how our USP is going to stand out. So um, it's three levels from easiest to harder. Um, and uh, each of these will contain a few different what we call edges. And those are different ways that our product can stand out. So the first edge is what we call product positioning. So product positioning is either changing the way you present the product, product concept or idea or emphasizing the product or feature in a different, different way. So this is a really good example of a really saturated category within Amazon, which is the travel packing cubes. And um, these guys didn't have a super unique product. Um, they had a two-sided packing cube. But what they did was they positioned this as a, uh, as, a, as a unique product that allowed you to keep the clean clothes on one side and the dirty clothes on the other side and the fact that it's say 40% space. So they entered a pretty saturated category. They launched on Kickstarter and did about $280,000 on their launch. This is another really great example of positioning. Um, blackout curtains are not a unique product by any means, but what these guys did is they focused on making this, uh, targeting the people that cared about portability. So they made uh, a specific emphasis on portable blackout curtains. And this was really, really successful. It raised over $290,000. So this is an example of a, um, of a positioning that's presenting the product to a new audience. So these are no shoe socks and these have existed for quite a while already. Um, it's, it's a different, usually a different audience, but what these guys did is they took this and presented it to uh, the female audience as uh, what they called after socks, which was what you'd wear after going out. So you don't have to wear heels um, when you're walking around after going out. So this became a really cool project that raised um, over 90,000 euros and really, really successful um, for, for that category. And this is one of my favorite examples of positioning. Um, this is the, uh, this is a, uh, essentially it's a desk toy. Um, it's, they call it the Zen egg. So what these guys did is they took this desk toy and they presented it as this, um, this concept that allows you to use it as a way to meditate and uh, create time for yourself. So really, really solid positioning and it did over a hundred thousand dollars. So, um, as you can see, there's virtually ways to do this with any type of product that exists. 
So the next edge um, is going to be level two, edge, edges two and three. So in these, it's going to be a little bit more than positioning. Um, what we're going to do is we're actually going to uh, uh, we're going to change something about the product. So edge two is about changing the materials or upgrading materials or changing the way it looks, but keeping the functionality of the product the same. Edge three is a small function upgrade, which means we're actually changing the, the way that the product works a little bit. So um, this is one of my favorite examples as well. Um, chopsticks are a thousand, thousands of year old product. What these guys did is they just changed chopsticks and made it titanium and they positioned it as aerospace grade titanium chopsticks and they raised over $270,000 uh, when they launched their Kickstarter. This is one of the clients that we worked with for, um, for travel, uh, travel towel. And so what they did was they replaced the traditional microfiber towel with uh, eco-friendly bamboo and they added a nice little pouch around it. And uh, when they launched this, this was a 200K launch. And this is another, as you can tell, I like packing cubes. This is another example of packing cubes. Uh, they implemented all three of these. So they, uh, what they did was they improved the material, they made it look really sexy, and um, they bundled this together in a seven piece set and called it the seven piece smart packing cube set. And they did over $280,000. So uh, one more example, because this shows really good positioning. Um, these guys made a folio. Essentially, it's where you keep your notepad. And um, they essentially made better material. It looks really cool. But they targeted this. They positioned this to an audience that was entrepreneurs or successful business people. And they called this the visionary portfolio collection. And they did $70,000 with, with this launch. So. Um, and now finally, we're just going to really quickly touch on advanced function upgrade, which is essentially to upgrade or change a new way for a product to be used. This was a collapsible um, cutlery set that was portable. These guys raised a million euros, so really, really cool product. Another one of my favorite categories, the plant category. These guys created a planter that allows the plants to grow on the outside. Obviously, a really cool product that, um, that requires a little bit of innovation, uh, but that raised $6.3 million. So um, really, really cool examples. But I really felt it was important to touch on USP because that's one of the most important elements of being able to launch a successful campaign, a campaign but also um, really anywhere on e-commerce. So after you've nailed that, the next step is to create your actual campaign. So uh, like I mentioned, this, this is equivalent to your, your product listing page on Amazon. It's equivalent to your website page where you list your product. Um, you need three key brand assets, your photos, your copy, and your video. And um, at this point, I've mentioned this earlier, but I want to reemphasize that these are assets that you normally need to create anyways for your any type of launch. So you're not doing anything different than you would in a regular launch. But the only difference is we want to emphasize that you invest in quality when it comes to this, because there's a definitely a high expectation um, for the level of quality when it comes to these, uh, the, these, these assets when it comes to Kickstarter launches. Next, um, you'll want to set your funding goal. So this is the funding goal that you have to hit in order to be successful. Uh, we recommend keeping it below $30,000, usually between $10,000 and $30,000 is what is the sweet spot. And when it comes to campaign duration, you can pick up to 60 days, but we highly recommend keeping it within the 30 to 45 day time range. We find this is where uh, this is the sweet spot for most campaigns to be successful. So next is to build your list. So I'm not going to go into details about um, why it's important to have a list. I know that's going to be uh, that's going to be really clear to a lot of you already. So let's talk about what we're actually going to do to build the list. So we're going to have two main categories of people in our list when it comes to helping us for our launch. And the first one is going to be ideal future customers, and the second one is influencers. So ideal future customers are eventually essentially the people that are eventually going to purchase our product. Uh, we have a lot of different ways to do this, both free and paid. But um, the most important question, regardless of how we go about this, is we always want to ask, where do these customers hang out and where do they spend their time? So uh, there might be online ways of doing this, for example, finding online forums, Reddit communities, uh, Facebook groups. But there might also be outside the box ways to find these communities in person. So for example, meetups, uh, these are different examples of groups that we use for our campaign. And the idea is to find where our customers hang out so we can interact with them there and begin building our community that way. The next category is super, super valuable. Um, it's influencers, and it's about finding people that can either bring credibility or traffic to our launch. And it's important with influencers that we're not trying to get as many influencers as possible. We're trying to get relevant influencers, and these are people that are going to be catering to our same ideal future customers. So when we do this, when we, we know when we tap into their audience, it's going to be relevant because these people are also going to be caring about our product as well. So, uh, for example, here, um, we used a lot of influencers for, uh, for credibility and we worked with what we call industry experts. So it's another category of influencer that allowed us to get credibility for the product that we were launching here, which was the, um, the sensory enhancing coffee glasses. So uh, once we have our list, the next step is to launch. 
And really, very, very much like Amazon, uh, there's an algorithm to Kickstarter. So our goal by building this list is that we have them available for, uh, for us to support us when we finally launch. And our goal is to get them to support us within the first 24 to 48 hours and to purchase the product within that time. So here we, we had a $20,000 goal and our goal was hit within the first 12 hours. But the idea here is once we get once we hit our goal and once we start getting a lot of momentum with our purchases, um, Kickstarter is going to pay attention to us and it's going to start ranking us organically so that we begin to get some more organic sales on the platform. Uh, next is optional but highly recommended, which is to take advantage and reach out to PR. So different types of blogs, publications, people that want to feature. Um, Generally, this is really positive because it drives external traffic to the campaign, but it's also positive for after the campaign because this allows us to be able to have different people talking about us. So when people are searching us, they're researching us, they're going to be able to find us in different parts of the internet. And finally, um, this is really, really cool. Um, once, you, once you have a customer that purchases your product, you can immediately contact them. So this is a really cool thing that you don't get with Amazon. Um, when you contact them, you can immediately ask them for help and to support and to, to share the campaign. So we highly recommend doing this. And we like to do things like contests or giveaways to encourage people to share right away so that new customers are excited to share um, right off the bat and, um, and support your brand and your product launch. Next, fulfilling your orders. This is pretty straightforward. Um, once you get paid within uh, 15 days from Kickstarter, um, you use this to place your inventory order um, with your manufacturer. Uh, we have a strategy where we move from Kickstarter to Indiegogo, and you can continue selling your pre-orders for um, before you get your inventory. So um, usually we find that um, that people that do this get on, on average of like 20 to 100 percent increase in sales. We did about 220,000 on Kickstarter, and we almost did another 100,000 on Indiegogo, all before the inventory arrived at our warehouse. So this is really, really awesome. So last thing is, of course, deliver on your promise so that your backers are going to be happy with um, with being your new customers. And finally, this is going to be something that is new to Amazon sellers. But what we're looking to do that's important for establishing our brand and something that we don't consider when we do Amazon is that we want to start getting content created for our brand. So what we do is we take advantage of this fact that people are receiving our product and we, we encourage them to do something called uh, user generated content, uh, UGC, UGC for short. And this includes things like unboxing videos, um, posting on social media, testimonials and reviews, uh, all, anything that you can imagine that creates media content. And that allows us to use this for ads, promotions, and all these all sorts of different things when it comes to our, um, uh, our, our media for our brand. So one more thing to add is now that these people are your customers. You have direct access to communication to them. You can send them surveys and ask them questions. Um, you can get ideas from them for your next product launches and things like that. Um, and you can also, at the end of the day, even um, even invite them to your upcoming launches, your second product launch, third product launch, um, whatever it is that you want to do with them. Um, that's how your, your customers are going to start experiencing your brand. So um, case studies, I'll go through these super quickly, but this is an example of a health and wellness brand that's called Better Backs. They make these back braces that help you um, keep your posture straight. Uh, they raised $3 million um, through crowdfunding, lots of fans, and this led them to selling on Amazon, their own website, selling on TV. Um, they even appeared on Shark Tank to, um, to, to pitch their product there, and they became really successful on multiple platforms and did a really good job with their brand. Uh, another example of a smaller campaign, and I don't want you to think that all these campaigns have to be $100,000 or millions of dollars. Um, this campaign was from a small company called uh, Treat a Tub, and they launched and raised uh, $40,000 um, on their campaign with only 800 backers. Um, this allowed them to eventually scale to Amazon, uh, selling on their website, and third-party retailers. And they do about um, 20K a month on Amazon and 20, uh, sorry, 200K a month on Amazon and 200K a month off Amazon. So um, that's pretty much it for, um, for the focus. So we're going to, uh, I have a few bonuses for you guys that you can definitely check out if you're interested in the pre-order launch model. So the first one is our launch hacker resources. So this is, um, you just opt in, you're going to get free resources that will allow you to understand what the, the process looks like and if this is something that's interesting to you. And the second bonus is um, an opportunity to join our case study masterclass and uh, potentially a launch strategy session. And our case study masterclass is we're essentially looking for a few people to work with in the next couple of months to create some successful case studies before our official launch. And this masterclass is based on the system, the lab that we've created for our agency and consulting clients that have 100% success. And at the end of the day, you're going to be learning how to plan, develop, and launch your next pre-order using crowdfunding 
and uh, that's really what's going to be able to help you with um, with your next launch. So the idea is we want to help you raise 30 to 50K in pre-orders for your next launch while creating a solid foundation for your brand and building that community. So um, we're accepting 12 people, but if you're not if you're not sure if your product is going to be a fit, um, you can book a free strategy session with us. We're offering eight uh, free strategy session calls, and to qualify, um, you have to be launching a product in the next eight months, and it has to be a B2C a consumer product. So uh, together we'll find out if Kickstarter is a fit for your category. And if it is, um, uh, you have an opportunity to join our case study uh, masterclass program with a $2,000 scholarship. If it's not, I'm happy to let you know that as well. So um, to access that, um, you'll just have to go to livemyplayground.com uh, slash global sources. And um, you can either choose launch hacker resources, or if you choose to either apply for the launch, um, the launch uh, launch strategy session or the masterclass, um, you'll get access to the first bonus also, so you don't have to do both. So um, I rushed through a lot there. I know I moved really quickly, but I wanted to make sure all of that was in there. Um, can we do some Q&A, Megla? Oops, I was muted. Yes, um, Vance, that was just so much information over there. Oh my gosh. Um, a lot of information packed into 30 minutes. So really good uh, insights and really good presentation. Thanks for that, Vance. Guys, if you have any questions for Vance, type them in the comments. Let us know what your questions are for Vance about using Kickstarter to uh, pre-launch products, basically. Um, and Vance will address those questions. I'm just going to remove your slides from here. There we go. So Vance, um, there are so many brands that launch on Kickstarter and so many products that are launched in Kickstarter. What is the approximate or the average success rate of uh, products that launch on Kickstarter? That's a really good question. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know that exact number. Um, I think, I mean, Kickstarter doesn't really release that data, but there's a really high failure rate. And um, the failure rate comes from uh, people not really being prepared and not really building that audience in advance. And that's why a key part of the strategy is to make sure that you're building an audience of people that really care about what your product is before you launch. And it's not about just putting it out there and hope that people are going to purchase. Uh, it doesn't really work that way. So part really uh, like a key focus of the process is to be able to build that momentum in advance by building that community and that audience that cares about your product. So uh, if people fail, it's most often because they haven't done that work in advance to build that community. Um, but I can't tell you exactly what the percentage of failure rates are. Okay, we've got a quite couple of questions here. So Vimanti is asking, what is the typical investment in Kickstarter and what is your fee? So um, the investment is really going to be dependent on a few things and depending on your category as well. But the two main categories you want to look at for investment is um, product development. So whatever it takes to create your product and get to the you know, samples, prototypes to get your physical product ready. And then the next category is um, essentially everything it takes to be able to build your product um, ready to market it. So uh, this comes with all the creative assets, photo, video, uh, copy if you're hiring somebody for that, um, ads, all those types of things that will come in a little bit later. But the idea here is that you'll, you'll have to focus on both those categories. Um, depending on what you have access to and which markets you're living in and um, your, your, your creative assets could be cheaper or more expensive. But in general, uh, I think a minimum range would be at least like five to fifteen thousand uh, dollars. And again, this is there's lots of variability. It's just like if you're able to find um, you know cheap people that can help you produce high quality assets, you don't need to like there's there's some really expensive people that make photo and video out there. So it's just really about finding the right types of vendors and that type of thing. So um, that's going to be um, that's going to be something that um, that it depends on where you are and um, the quality that you're going for. Right. Emma is asking, love this model and would love to get involved. Are you able to share your slides with us? So yes, Emma, we will be sharing um, all speakers slides and do make sure that you are registered for Global Sources Summit. If you haven't already done so, go to this URL, globalsource.com forward slash summit, put in your email address, register for the summit, and we'll send all of the slides and all the replays to you via email. You'll also get to join our Telegram group and we're going to be sharing uh, a lot of inf information and the replay links in the Telegram group as well. So thank you so much, Vance, for um, the very insightful presentation. Lots of good info, lots of good tips for people. So really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, have a great night or day. Yeah, you guys right, are in the day. You too. <laughs> day, yeah, we're in the day. Early morning yeah. here. <laughs> All right, see you guys. All right. Thank see you, Vance. Bye. Bye.
Okay. okay. So what's next, Karen? Okay, well, we'll have um, smart gaming earphones from Bill in Shenzhen. Hi, Bill. Hi, Karen. Nice to meet you. Um, we have Megla here, who's also our host. So, Hi, Bill. Um, How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, Should I start? Um, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you have some really interesting earphone, I recall. So let's see them. You want Hi, to start everyone. with your PowerPoint or your video, or you just want? Okay. Hi, everyone. We have been a professional consumer in electronics manufacturer since 2005 for over 17 years. We mainly provide ODM and OEM services, backed by more than 20 R&D staff and four own factories, more than 40,000 square meters in total. Let me show you a short video clip about our company. Today, I would like to show you our best-selling TWS earbuds, F-150 and F-155. Both earbuds are specially designed for gaming. It has elegant and streamlined design, featuring LED breathing light of seven colors, both on the case and on the inner buds. As you can see, looks very cool. Let me show you some slides to help you get into details. You probably know that transmission delay is the key to success in gaming. Both earbuds are carefully engineered to have the lowest transmission latency among products within the same price range in the industry, less than 65 milliseconds real life test. This is in terms of gaming concept rather than just outside look, like some other products in the industry. These two models are equipped with composite membrane, eight millimeter drive unit to deliver excellent sound quality. Another unique feature will be dual modes. You can easily switch between game mode and music mode to save battery life when you are just listening to music. For the service of the case, we use dual layer painting service with rubber-like texture. This is advanced technology, so it looks great, feels great when you touch it, and resistant to fingerprints. As for battery life, the standard configuration supports six hours without the case and 24 hours in total with the case. And same as all of our products, all configurations could be customized, including battery, drive unit, service, color, and so on. F-150 was awarded Global Sources Analyst Choice last year. These are innovative and cutting edge products reviewed and selected independently by Global Sources Analysts. If you are looking for TWS products with design and features that could better attract customers' attention and desire to buy, and within the price range of seven to eight dollars, this is your best choice in the industry. The minimum order quantity will be 500 pieces. Free samples will be available to all who reach out to us from this virtual summit. Besides Bluetooth headphones, our company also has a wide range of product lines, including car chargers, wall chargers, wireless chargers, and USB cables. We welcome OEM orders as well. Our engineering team will work you through the whole process to deliver the best solution to meet your expectation and achieve lower production costs. Please check out our page on Global Sources for more information. If you have any questions or want to request product catalog or samples, feel free to contact me via email. That's all for my presentation. Any questions? Thank you very much. 
Um, Thank you. I, I, have a, I have a really quick question. I saw that you, the case can stand, can charge for six hours, right? But how long does it take to charge the case? Because for people uh, like me, I always run to the last bit of the battery. So how long does it take for the ch cases to charge? It should take like two or three hours to charge to, to its full power. Uh, okay, so um, I assume it also comes with a cable, right? Yeah. Last time sure. I bought one without a cable. Yeah. <laughs> and okay, it comes do we have with any... a Type C cable. Type C. Okay, so it goes by Type yeah. C. So, do we have any questions from the audience? So we don't have any questions from the audience so far. Um, but I, I heard um, Bill say that he's going to be giving free samples to everyone. Uh, who's attending yeah, the summit. Sure. So that's amazing. Thank you so yeah. much for that, Bill. So guys, take advantage of this offer, get in touch with them and, um, you know, get your samples. Yeah. And uh, everyone can get in contact with Bill via globalsources.com slash wxdelectronics.co. You will find his um, whole selection there as well. So yeah, feel free to contact him there. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Bill. Bye. It's good to have free samples because people will know what they're actually getting and selling. That's a really exactly. good idea. Okay. Yeah. Next up, we have Jackie, who does environmental LED glow lights. Hi, Jackie. Good morning. Good, good morning, morning, Karen. Good morning, good morning Jackie. Hi, good morning. Nice yes. to see you again here. Yes. So um, you have some lights to show us, right? Yes, especially our grow light for agriculture section. Okay, so go ahead. I'll add your PowerPoint to the screen. So shall I start? My yes, please. Okay. All right, global fans, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to my live uh, chatting room. Today, I'm going to talk about Shenzhen number as a manufacturer and supplier for grow light. As you can see, we have um, over 18 years experience in this industry. So we manufacture, distribute, and also we engineers, designs, and sell our own brand to global customers. And we have global distrib distribution uh, network, you can see from the map. And meanwhile, we have different patents, design patents, and software copyright and trademarks. And meanwhile, we have past the uh, domestic and international certificates. Mima, this is a brief introduction of our company and factory. We have skill, skillful oh. worker. Jackie, Jackie. Sorry, Jackie. But um, your slides are not changing on the screen. So um, do you want to share slides instead of share screen? Or yeah, actually, my, my PPT has uh, has been revised. Actually, you can see the the, the, the content uh, revision. Yeah. Yeah, because we cannot see you going through the slides, so that is the problem. Oh. Yeah. So please share slides instead of your screen. Yeah, I think uh, I think the slides are changing now. He's moved uh, to okay. the next slide. This is a yeah, better okay. way, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay, you can go on. Okay, continue, Jackie. Yes, I will. Yeah, just make sure you're changing the slides. Yeah. Oops, what happened? <laughs> no worries. Actually, I have um, my, my technical colleague with me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, I see it. And this is Here better. Is. Yeah. Okay. Please go on. Uh, yes. And this is where my um, my factory was located, and the aging room, plucking line, planting laboratory, and also the LED production line. And thirdly, this is the display of our main product, including the HPS, and also the LED grow light, especially applied for greenhouse, indoor growing, and also for the tent. And this is the display of our main product. Um, we have from 400 watt to 1,200 uh, 1, watt. And also we have the quantum boat LEDs. 
And meanwhile, we can, uh, we can make the free lighting layout, I mean, the solution for the customers. And here you can see uh, our project application globally, especially used for the cannabis growing. So finally, you can see we have um, more than 18 years experience assistant. And also we have the uh, overseas um, warehouse in the United States, in Europe, and we can provide local after service, sales services. Yeah, and also we officially um, warranty for five years. Well, that's all for my sharing. Thank, thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, please let me know. Karen, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, I saw that you have local after sales services. May I know um, where, like, where, is there any specific location that you guys are located or are you yeah, able especially, to travel? Just... Especially in, in the United States, we have the warehouse in uh, California mm -hmm. and also in Europe, we have the warehouse in the Italy. So we can ensure the local um, after sales services. We have staff there and we have the RD center there. Yeah. Especially, mm -hmm. I'd like to say that we have team there or consisting oh, okay. of, 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 of local staff. Yeah. Nice, very yeah. nice. Um, so, Megla, do you have any questions? Or do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah we don't we have any questions. We are working for a specified, specified industry, grow light industry. So, yeah. Yeah, it's yes. very specific for. If you guys have any questions. It's very specific for agricultural services. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let's. Um, Elton for is people just saying that, interesting session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, okay. So, for people that are interested in Jackie's product, please reach out to him at globalsources.com slash sz number dot co. His company name is Sunjin um, number, Energy. Number yeah. Number Energy, energy Saving. Yeah. yeah, so it's an eco-friendly product, so do reach out to him. Thank you very much, Jackie. I appreciate your time. Thank really. you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you so much bye bye. Time. Have a nice day. Bye. You Thank too. You. Bye bye. Okay. So we had a very intensive morning today. Well, evening for some people. For us, it's early morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and now comes the fun part. <laughs> yeah, the prices. Um, I'm very happy that we had a lot of um, very um, nice speakers and sponsors. First of all, well, to, to, for this session, we have two special prices. First of all, is from Belinda Ted Peck. Um, she's going to offer us a bundle worth USD 385 each, and that will include um, design services and um, templates. And then also, um, you can also speak to her in person to well, actually virtually now um, to talk about the service that she can provide. So to get this prices, you'll have to answer questions asked by Megla. So everybody get your keyboard ready, get your fingers ready. This will be some yeah, questions so we're that you guys be asking, be able to answer. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we're going to be asking a couple of questions and the person to respond uh, to give the correct answer first is going to be the winner. So you've got to be really quick at the keyboard. You've got to type fast. You can go Google if you don't know the answer, but you've got to be fast. That's the key to winning this prize. So let's go ahead and uh, display the first question. Is everybody ready? Here comes the first question for a bundle of $385 from Tech Packs. In which year was Global Sources established? Now let's take a look at the comments over here. Uh, Karen and I will keep a look at uh, the comments and see who's the first to answer. Now we're uh, live streaming on multiple platforms, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. So regardless of where you are watching, whoever is the first, we're gonna be able to see the comments over here. And if you guys want, you can Google this as well. Um, that is not a problem, but you've just got to be quick. So there is a slight delay, Karen, you know, from the yes. time that we speak and the time that it's uh, displayed on Facebook and social media channels. So it's going to take maybe 10, 15 seconds for people to see the message. So guys, let us know. Oh my gosh. Okay. We've got so many answers that came in. 
And yeah. the first person to answer is Richard De La Fente. Richard, congratulations. You are the winner. You're the first winner of $385 worth of um, prizes from Tech Packs Co. And guys, what you need to do is you need to send an email to gsevent at globalsource.com and let us know that you have won this prize and then we'll help you uh, to avail the prize. So make sure that you are emailing us at gsevent at globalsources.com. Okay, that was good. Let's go on to the second question. Now, this is easy. I'm going to start with the easy questions. And then as the summit progresses, we're going to get more difficult questions. And the last one for the bumper mega prize is going to be a super difficult question. Okay, question number two. Ready, guys? Fingers on your keyboard. In which city are Global Sources exhibitions held? Now, again, this is a very easy question. If you've been following Global Sources, you should already know this. Um, but let us know. Now, Global Sources exhibitions have been held for, I think, over 15, 20 years now. How, how long have they been held, Karen? Uh, do, you, do you know? <laughs> when did when they start? A really long time ago. <laughs> yeah, way before I joined the company. <laughs> oh, we got... <laughs> Answers already. That was oh, we have, a win we have a winner. Yes. So let's see who yes. got it right first. And uh, Naoji Bill. Naoji Bill is the winner for this question. We've got a couple of other people who have responded as well, but Naoji Bill was the first to respond. So congratulations, Naoji. And again, don't forget to send an email to gsevent at globalsource.com to let us know that you have won this prize. So those were the first two winners. And Karen, what's the next prize that we have? Next thing is something very special because we'll be hosting <laughs> a, well, Megla, our super host, will be hosting an Indian sourcing workshop next month, uh, which is, um, will be on June 17th and 24th of Hong Kong time. And then you guys are welcome to register. There's a link to, Yes. Um, yeah. Um, and then, well, we can find more details on globalsources.com slash India hyphen workshop. And the special price for this question will be a 50% off for the admission fee. So let's see the question. Yes. And before so, I display the question, I want to tell okay. people about this workshop. Just want to give a yeah. quick introduction. So um, I, uh, you know, in case you guys don't know, I also specialize in helping Amazon e-commerce sellers source products from India um, for the last couple of years. And this workshop is basically going to be the A to Z of sourcing from India. It's going to cover everything you need to know in order to source private label products from India, starting from, first of all, which products to source, because a lot of people are you know, aware of what's available in China, but there's not a lot of information about what India and other alternative markets are able to produce. So we're going to kick off with you know, what products to source from India. What are some of the differences between India and China? What are the advantages and disadvantages of sourcing from India? What are some of the mistakes to avoid? What are the pitfalls to avoid? And then how to find suppliers, how to vet suppliers, how to make sure that the supplier you're selecting is actually the right supplier for you. That is super important. And then we're also going to be covering things like logistics and shipping. How does logistic work? How, how long does it take? Are the costs lower? Are the costs higher? What are the delivery lead times from India typically? And then we're also going to be talking about quality control and inspections. What is the process? How do you ensure quality? Can you source directly from a manufacturer or do you need to go through a sourcing agent? That's an important question that you need to ask. And a, a lot of people who are starting to source from a new market have these questions. So this is a workshop that is going to be held over two days. Uh, it's, it's four hours each day. So it's a really long, comprehensive workshop. I'm going to be hosting most of the workshop. And then we've also got some other presenters. Uh, we've got a logistics expert who's coming in to talk about all shipping and logistics. And then we've got a QC expert talking about inspections and quality control. And then we've also got an Amazon seller who's been sourcing products from India for over five years. She's built her brand with Made in India products in the US, and she's going to be sharing her experiences and her 
uh, learnings sourcing from India over the last few years. So, you know, guys, if you're in this business of e-commerce, if you're building a brand, you know that it's it's not okay to put all your eggs in one basket anymore. You can't source, you can't depend entirely on one sourcing market. You must diversify your sourcing markets because there's just so much uncertainty. I think the last few years have really taught us, you know, with COVID, with lockdowns, sometimes there were lockdowns in China, then there were lockdowns in India, and it was just so crazy. And even now, you know, what's happening in China, there, there are supply chain disruptions. So increasingly, it's super important to diversify your sourcing markets and India is a great alternative to China. And a lot of people are actually developing a China plus one strategy and they are sourcing from India. So yeah, check the workshop out and uh, it's gonna be super valuable, a lot of great information. So let's get started with the question. <laughs> and this okay. is a question that's related to production in India. And I'm gonna display the question on the screen now. So guys get ready for the question and fingers on the keyboard. Okay, this is a true or false question. So you need to type in the comments, true or false. India is known for producing items made out of mango wood. True or false? Let's see who gets this. So not a lot of people know what kind of products are made in India. Okay. Uh, we have some suppliers from India in, uh, later in the summit as well. So we can also ask them the same question. <laughs> And um, that's yeah. very true to have China plus one now because it's very important to have alternatives. And then, oh, we have answers already. Wow. Oh, yes, we have answers. So let's see who is the first to give the answer. We've got, uh, oh, let look me. at that. Zach yeah. Franklin. <laughs> Zach, it's great to see you here. And yes, that is correct. True. India specializes in mango wood products. And in fact, Zach has traveled to India as well a couple of years ago for a different project. So congratulations, Zach. You are the winner of 50% um, off of our India Sourcing Workshop. And uh, send an email to gsevent at globalsource.com to avail the prize. Okay, so those were the three prizes that uh, we were giving away uh, this time. And uh, Karen, over to you now. Yeah, we will have more prices at the end of each session for the rest of summit. So we have three more sessions. And then the grand prize will be, as mentioned earlier by Megla, we will have our physical exhibitions in Hong Kong soon. And then um, the grand grand prize will be free air tickets plus hotel to our next exhibition in Hong Kong. So stay till the very last of the summit to make sure you earn everything that you can. Um, that was, we had uh, some intensive sessions this morning so okay and also some great prices some supplier presentations and meanwhile while we're on a break you guys can visit globalsources.com slash summit to register if you haven't done so so you can get the latest information and also visit our um suppliers our um presenters our speakers website and also get the um offers from gamba and tech 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 code so um, we will be back later for our afternoon, which will be 4 p.m. Hong Kong time. What time will it be for you, Megla? That'll be 1.30 p.m. for me in India. Yes. And then um, so that will be in about less, just less than six hours. So people do go to our websites, all the different links, and then come back in six hours for more information and more learning. See all right, you guys. we'll see you all in six hours. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.